Okay, your book. Let's go on a journey of the mind. This was such an incredible book. This book really, it, it felt like I was reading something that I've been having these intuitions for quite some time, and it felt like I was reading my own thoughts at some point. Um, before we start, I think it's always important when we go into a conversation like this, the listeners need to have a shared understanding of what we're discussing. So I think definitions play a huge role in this regard. Let's define consciousness, the self, and the mind. All right, well, let me uh, start with the mind. It, actually, let me even step back even further to say, I'm going to be sharing ideas about consciousness and the mind that I suspect most of your listeners have never heard before. I and my fellow co-author, Sai Gadam, who I wrote Journey of the Mind with, we have a different background than most people who study consciousness, a mathematical background. Uh, we have always approached these problems from a mathematical perspective. And even more than that, as I'll describe in a few minutes, I've had other sources of ideas and math about all of this as well. So it's going to sound different, but I'm going to do my best to explain everything in clear, simple terms so that anybody can follow along. So you asked for some definitions. Let's start with the mind, because getting a basic understanding of the mind is critical if you want to understand the deep mysteries like consciousness, self-consciousness, language, and other things even higher above consciousness and self-consciousness. And so here's the most important thing to understand about the mind. The mind is activity. The word mind is an action noun like dance or game or combat. Everything that we experience, when everything that we think about or feel is activity, activity in the mind. If you want to understand the mind, if you want to understand things like consciousness, language, self-awareness, emotion, how do we feel? How do we feel love? That If we want to understand these things, then you must think about the mind in terms of activity. This is perhaps the greatest fallacy, the greatest pitfall for all people, but including scientists, is mistaking things for activities. Chemists used to think that combustion was a liquid called phlogiston. Uh, physicists used to think that heat was a substance, also a liquid uh, called caloric. Uh, biologists thought that life was a substance called Elan Vital, a thing. In each of these cases, our natural intuition makes us expect a thing. But when we look at it, we find out each of these are collective dynamics, collective dynamics of molecules in the cases of combustion and heat, collective activity of cells in the case of life. And in consciousness, it is the collective activity of all of our neurons and modules. And we'll describe that exact activity. But this has been the number one uh, fallacy which trips up so many people. They go looking for that thing, that magic neuron, that magic energy, that magic substance. Uh, some people even go so far to say it's a hard problem that can't possibly uh, be solved. That's baloney. That's silly. That's, that's a cowardly, <laughs> unscientific uh, approach uh, from the 20th century. Nobody should be talking about the hard problem anymore. We're way past the hard problem. The physical dynamics of consciousness were already figured out before the hard problem was even proposed. In 1982, Stephen Grossberg first identified the physical dynamic of consciousness, and he and now us have been building on that ever since. There never should have been a, a distraction like the hard problem. Uh, that was a very long introduction, and <laughs> probably more than you wanted, but no, no, it's very important to set up this perspective. No. I would call my view of the mind the dynamic mind, viewing the mind as dynamics, as activity. Nail down the activity in the mind, and you will understand the way of mind. I'm I'm scheduled to chat to Stephen at some point because we we were exchanging emails and we're about to, we're going to chat about this. I think it's the perfect time. Then let's go into his his work and how it paved the way for your work for you inside. Stephen Grossberg is the greatest living scientist, and he is certainly in the running to be considered one of the greatest scientists of all time. Why would I make such a seemingly outrageous claim? How could somebody that most people have never even heard of? How am I calling him the greatest scientist alive right now with full confidence? Here's why. Isaac Newton opened up modern science, opened up modern physics by trying to figure out the dynamics of matter, the dynamics of motion. 
and he threw out everything that was known, everything that was believed about physical reality and took physical motion on its own terms. He did his own experiments, wrote his own equations. He figured it out from scratch without any preconceived notions. He figured out the dynamics of motion on its own terms, figured it out. That started science. That started physics. Wonderful. Brilliant work. Steve Grossberg did the same thing with the mind. The big problem is, oh, the big challenge in mind science has always been one simple question. What is the right math to understand the mind? What is the right math for thinking? And everybody, first, for half of the 20th century, nobody even cared about the math. Freud, no math. Behaviorism, they had a little math, but they didn't want math for thoughts. They didn't want math for anything inside the mind. So they didn't care about it either. Cognitive science, the Noam Chomsky and Steven Pinker crowd, still no math. They just have simplified abstractions, black boxes. This goes to here, to here, to here. Algorithmic a little bit, but not math. Still no math. Finally, 21st century, we finally get mathematical models of the mind. There are three, three major mathematical models of the mind. The least known one, the most obscure one, is ours, dynamic mind, associated with Stephen Grossberg. We'll get back to him in a moment. What are the challengers? The statistical mind. Mm -hmm. Some people think the mind is a Bayesian machine that is calculating probabilities and statistics. The reason this ridiculous idea has maintained itself and become so popular is because of the astounding success of artificial intelligence, which is based on statistical math. Uh, deep learning kinds of algorithms, these chatbot algorithms, these are all statistical algorithms, very effective for what they do, but the brain is nothing like that because the brain is not a thing. Statistics looks at things. The brain is not a thing. The other view of the mind we might call the digital mind or perhaps an information processing mind. The idea that the mind is an information processing system, usually technically this is the idea that the mind follows the rules uh, and properties of an uh, information uh, theory system uh, devised by Claude Shannon. Um, but all the assumptions to apply information theory, they do not apply to the brain. The brain is not an information processing system. It is not processing digital inputs. It's not uh, operating the way a Shannon kind of information system is. These are distractions. These are math forms of mathematics that were developed long ago for other subjects. So unlike what Isaac, what Isaac Newton did, these scientists, instead of trying to figure out how the brain, the math for the brain, just adopted math from other things. Why in the world would the math for astronomy, which is what statistics came from, or the mass, math of information systems, which is what, uh, fr from logic, uh, you know, from a hundred years ago, why would that have anything to do with this incredibly complicated neural architecture of the brain? It doesn't. So what Steven Grossberg did, why he is the greatest living scientist is he threw all of that out. And at the age of 17, he sat down like Newton and from scratch said, what is the right math for understanding the mind? And he's calculated, he figured it out as a 17 year old. He figured out the dynamics for the most complicated and sophisticated module uh, in the brain. What, what the second most sophisticated module in the brain, the where module, which takes a sequence of inputs and creates a single representation of a sequence of inputs, like a phone number or a grocery list, that sort of thing. This is a very, this is one of the most challenging modules in the mind to understand mathematically. And he figured it out as a 17 year old. And ever since then, he's been building on this piece by piece, trying to figure out the right math for everything in the mind, for every function from a visual recognition to audio tracking, to smelling, to planning, to free will, every part of the mind at every level he has put math to an integrated system of dyna dynamic system of math that accounts for almost everything in the brain including consciousness it's incredible i can see the excitement when you talk about his work and uh, you obviously draw a lot from it when you talk about these three laws of consciousness let's let's get into it and i think let's also discuss because it's it's obvious that you have people like Carl Friston, you've got a lot of other thinkers now with hierarchical Bayesian brain theories, computational theories of the mind. Why do you think it's growing as much as it is in that regard? And thereafter, I think let's move into the dynamics of this, of the mathematics behind your theory of consciousness. Again, I think Bayesian theories are popular because the math is so worked out, it's so familiar, people get trained in that. Mm -hmm. And it's you're given a hammer, you look for nails. 
is the thing. This, this is the problem. This is why mind science has always lagged behind the physical sciences and why it's such a challenge is you got to learn math that you've never heard of before that you're not familiar because it's not the math of the physical world. It's the math of mind and thinking. It's not just a reflection of the stars or you know orbiting the center of the galaxy. It's nothing like that. It's wholly different dynamics, wholly different math. It's very hard if you haven't done it before. It's very challenging. It's more challenging than learning quantum physics and relativity. Those are easy compared to the math that Steven Grossberg has shared with us for the mind. But Bayesian math is very easy and it's very familiar. And you'll this huge communities of people that you can talk about with and that will understand it. I understand it, you know, but it, it's not describing the brain. Look, here's how you know in science if you're on the right track. It's very easy. You start to find integrations. Isaac Newton had the first integration in science. He integrated the dynamics of Earth with the dynamics of heaven. Everybody thought the physics in heaven was different than the physics in Earth. He showed no. Gravity is the same everywhere. The dynamics of the motion are the same everywhere, heaven and Earth. Then physics just had a jamboree, a celebration of integrations. Electri electricity and magnetism to electromagnetism. Electromagnetism and the weak force to electroweak. Just endless, endless integrations. Meanwhile, my field, mind science, nothing. No integrations whatsoever. Reinventing the wheel every decade, year after year. Let's start again. Let's start again. Mm -hmm. When did the integrations happen? Steven Grossberg rolled with the integrations. Oh, my God. Integration after integration. Uh, he showed that the processing of surfaces is integrated with the process of boundaries in our visual system. He showed how our system to recognize an object, to recognize a visual object, it's integrated with the process of figuring out where that object is and vice versa. To know where an object is, you need to figure out uh, what that object is. He has done dozens, if not more, integrations of all kinds in the mind things that seem separate, that seem like different parts of the brain that didn't really have anything to do with each other. He showed how math can combine them. He has had a storm of integrations that rivals what has happened in physics. So sticking to that theme, I mean, we discussed these Bayesian brains, we've discussed computers. What about the other theories of consciousness? We've got global workspace theory, neuronal theories of consciousness, like integrated information theory. I think yours sort of falls along the lines of a global workspace theory. And then obviously branches out considering that that's focused so, on. I, I, I know this is a bit uncouth and impolite. Mm -hmm. I'm not in academia. So look, it's like Einstein worked out the theory of relativity and there's people that show up and say, you know what? I think time might not be absolute. I think time might change. And then, you know, Einstein's like, well, you know, I have the theory of relativity. Yes, time does change. And they're like, well, we're going to figure it out on our own. All right. You know, the, these are much, much simpler and limited. There's no integrations. Mm. If workspace theory was the answer, you should see it connecting with all kinds of stuff. It should, language should fall out of it. Self-awareness should fall out of it. Free will should fall out of it naturally, which is what happens with Grossberg's explanation of consciousness. Once you understand the math for it, everything starts to tie together. Uh, we, we, we're thinking about this as trying to unify everything into one. So sort of getting a general explanation for everything with one solid theory of consciousness. With his theory of consciousness, you talk about the three laws. Do you want to run through yeah, them? Let, let, me, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you. I'm going to blow your mind now okay. and, and, and make this show, uh, uh, well, very memorable. So I need to share a couple things about myself and why exactly I'm so interested in consciousness and why I've chosen the path that I did, because I'm not in academia. Academia is too slow and too limiting for, for what I've been trying to do. So let me explain a bit about who I am. So uh, I am a mathematical neuroscientist, among other things, um, and I'm autistic. And one thing about autistic folks is that we often have special interests, a subject that captivates and beguiles us. It could be anything like coins, horses, uh, Taylor Swift, uh, a TV show like Wednesday, anything could be it. In my case, I've had a special interest since I was a child that I've been relentlessly uh, pursuing. My special interest is the fundamental nature of reality. And when I was 18 years old, I had an event, a life-changing 
ground shaking event that influenced my entire life and is still influencing me today now that I've turned 50. So my whole life, more than 30 years, has been influenced by this event. What was the event? I communicated with Intex, with intelligent extraterrestrials. I have been sharing math and science, or they have been sharing math and science with me for 30 years. Okay. So let me share with you now. This is amazing. What they have shared with me is a cosmic cycle to reality, a cosmic cycle to physical reality. Let me explain it very quickly. As you'll see, it incorporates much which, which is in Journey of the Mind. Journey of the Mind was the first attempt to share some of the math and science that Intex have shared with me. So let me really quickly, it will take less than five minutes. No, no, take your time. Just give you the, su the summary of what Intex has shared with me, and then we can talk about it. Because the questions you're asking will all fit into this. So first is understanding the mind is dynamics. Second, reality, physical reality that we all inhabit consists of two superclasses of dynamics. There are two superclasses of dynamics in reality. One are purposeless dynamics, aimless dynamics. This is physics. This is the way of matter. The way of matter has no goal. It has no point. This is physical laws. But there's also the way of mind, dynamics that have purpose, dynamics with an aim. All the dynamics in our mind have a name. These are different physical dynamics than physics. They have goals. They try to change things. They try to reshape physical systems. Reality consists of the interaction of the way of mind and the way of matter. Physicists have done a great job with the way of matter. To do the way of mind, you need a lot of math. And as I said, that's where he kind of has fallen short until Stephen Grossberg showed us the way with the math of the dynamics mind. So these intexts over the past 30 years, they've shared with me something called the cosmic cycle. Let me outline it for you. When the way of matter, when purpose, purposeful dynamics interacts with purposeless dynamics, physics, what is produced is a ladder of purpose, ladder of purpose. Each rung on the ladder is a different stage of thinking, a different physical, dy physical dynamic of the mind, a different mental dynamic. At the bottom rung are the molecule minds. These are or single-celled organisms, archaea, bacteria, protozoa. Every thinking element in their minds is an individually identifiable molecule. And hallow archaea, for example, chases sunlight. It has a single molecule in its membrane that's photosensitive and it changes its shape. And changing its shape triggers a molecular cascade that triggers molecular filaments, flagella, to wave and moves towards the light. The thinking elements in these molecule minds are molecules at the lowest level of the ladder of purpose. The next level of the ladder of purpose are the neuron minds. These are jellyfish, worms, and all insects. All invertebrates have neuron minds. They have the top level thinking element in neuron minds is neural networks. It's a network, a circuit of neurons. Here's what's very important, crucial to understand about the letter of purpose. Every individual neuron is a self-contained module mind. So we have a recursive hierarchy of thinking. Within a jellyfish, every neuron still has its own aims, its own purpose, its own mental activity, its own unique activity that is always functioning. But now it's it's a put into a circuit. It's into a collective, which creates a second layer of dynamics, neural dynamics, interneuron dynamics. The third stage of thinking on Earth and throughout the cosmos is module minds. On Earth, these are the vertebrate minds fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, they are all module minds. The top level thinking element in these minds is a module. A module is a collection of neural networks for a particular purpose. We've talked about some modules already. There's a visual what module. Its function is to determine what a visual object is. There's an audio what module that determines what an object is from the sound of it. There's visual and audio where modules. They locate where objects are in space. There's a how module that controls our reaching, our targeting. The why module, responsible for our feeling, assigning emotional valences to situations, ideas, objects, or people. So in the vertebrate minds, the top level of thinking is a module mind. And once again, every module is a self-contained neuron mind. Third recursive level of thinking going on in these minds. All right. All minds face a challenge, a perpetual, incessant, and very important challenge called the attention dilemma. 
the attention dilemma is easy to explain. What should I focus on now? What should I focus on next? There's an attention dilemma in molecule minds. There's an attention dilemma in neuron minds. But when we get to the module minds, vertebrates, animals, elephants and reptiles and, and, and alligators, when we get to these minds, the attention dilemma is much more challenging because you have all these modules, each doing their own thing. So the visual, what module is processing its own thing, the audio aware module might be processing something entirely different. Your individual neurons are processing different things, your individual neural networks. It's this complicated system with lots of parallel activity at lots of these hierarchical levels, all going on, all doing the different things. How do you get this incredibly complicated parallel hierarchical system to instantly all focus on the same thing at once? The answer is consciousness, very specifically a consciousness cartel. So some of these modules, not all of them, we'll talk about the difference in a moment. Some of these modules are capable of producing a conscious experience. It's very easy to know. We know exactly which models are capable of producing consciousness. They are the modules that have a particular kind of physical dynamic. The dynamic is resonance. Resonance is consciousness. Resonance is the physical embodiment of a conscious experience. Whenever you're aware of something, I'm aware of my hand in front of me, there's resonance going on in my brain. So how does this resonance solve the attention dilemma? How does this resonance in a module solve this problem of getting the whole mind to focus on something important all at the same time? Here's how it works. In every module that's capable of generating consciousness, there is a top-down field and a bottom-up field. There is an expectation or a prediction, what we think is going to happen, what we expect to see, and there's a bottom-up uh, input, the facts on the ground, the reality. So in a module, it compares a top-down expectation to a bottom-up facts on the ground. And if they match, it generates resonance. Resonance is physical activity that synchronizes, prolongs, and amplifies the activity of these two fields, of the expectations and the facts. It's like two musical instruments playing the same note at the same time, a violin and a trumpet both playing middle C at the same time. When they do, it will that note will be louder, it will be longer, we'll perceive it as longer, and the musicians naturally adjust their playing so that the notes exactly they're on the same pitch and, and last together. So they synchronize as well. So a conscious experience is like a violin and a trumpet playing the same note in your brain at the same time. Now, as we said, there's a lot of modules, a lot of modules capable of generating consciousness. So at any given moment, all your modules are processing different things, paying attention to different things, and they're all trying to say, hey, what I'm resonating on right now is the most important thing in the mind. And so the resonances are competing. Whoever has the strongest resonance wins control of the consciousness cartel, wins control of attention. So, you know, I'm talking to you and I'm focused on uh, you, Tevin. But if I hear somebody say the house is on fire, my whole mind is now going to switch and focus my audio uh well, there's a few modules involved in processing speech, but the audio modules processing speech are, is going to resonate loudly. Uh, it's going to be amplified very strongly. And it's like if, if you toss rocks in a pond and there's ripples. So that somebody yelling, the house is on fire, would be something like somebody throwing in a boulder that creates huge ripples. The resonance is intense and it causes the rest of the modules to synchronize. So it's like the big ripples from a boulder in the lake kind of taking over the little ripples from the pebbles, which is the other modules. And then the whole mind is now synchronized. Your, your visual, your audio, your planning, they're all going to resonate on the same input, uh, the possibility that the house is on fire. So this is the first three rungs of the ladder of purpose. But it doesn't stop there. It, does, it keeps on going. There is a fourth level of thinking, a fourth level of dynamics that only humans have. Mm -hmm. So we are actually each person, you, Tevin and me, we are the top level thinking elements in the human supermind, in the sapiens supermind. Our brains are designed like network routers. We can only survive if we're part of a network. This is why if human beings don't learn language, if you raise a child to not speak, not only do they not acquire language, they can't function. They can't take care of themselves. They can't survive in any environment on their own. Our minds, everything about us, is designed to function in a community, in a system. Hundreds of thousands of years of evolution has reshaped our mind to be part of a community. 
the biggest, uh, most obvious example of this is a bias that we all have, a psychological bias called the intergroup bias or just tribalism, that we tend to think what our group thinks. It's very, it's very uncomfortable for us to think something that our group, our community uh, doesn't think. This is the strongest uh, uh, element of, uh, uh, of tribalism and supermind dynamics. And language. Language is how all these minds communicate with each other in the supermind. So here's another tricky thing, which has stumped and baffled so many consciousness researchers. Consciousness and self-consciousness are two distinct dynamics. They are not one and the same. If I am conscious of my hand, there is different physical activity in my brain than if I'm conscious of myself being aware of my hand. My gosh, I am looking at a hand. I am thinking about myself looking at my hand. When that happens, there's another layer of conscious. It's language. So we have a consciousness cartel. We share our consciousness cartel with all the animals. So chimpanzees, uh, uh, monkeys, birds, reptiles, amphibians have different cortexes. So it's not exactly the same, but the same basic consciousness dynamics are there. But we have the same consciousness cartel, certainly as dogs uh, and platypuses. But uh, uh, we also have language. So there's a separate dynamic between the language modules in our brain and our consciousness cartel, which is responsible for self-awareness. Self-awareness is neither automatic, instinctive, nor easy. Nobody had self-awareness, most likely before the 1600s and Descartes. It requires a supermind around you with complicated ideas, philosophical ideas, scientific ideas, just the simple idea of introspection. We all take it for granted. The ancient Greeks didn't have introspection. They didn't have these sorts of ideas. We had the idea that we can look into ourselves and be self-aware. That is a complicated, sophisticated concept that requires a community of scientists, uh, and philosophers, and thinkers around you to have. But it doesn't even stop there. It keeps on going. So above the supermind, we call it the next level would be a hypermind. It's when superminds come together. One consequence of this view of the ladder of purpose in the cosmic cycle is that cities and nation states, including the United States, can be conscious because their physical dynamics are the same as the physical dynamics of consciousness in our brain. If physical dynamics are the same, it's the same phenomenon. We can make predictions about the uh, great red spot on Jupiter uh, based on looking at hurricanes on Earth. It's not the same substance. The substance of the great uh, red spot on Jupiter, it's hydrogen, it's other gases here on Earth, it's water and air in a hurricane. But by studying the dynamics of the hurricane, we can make accurate predictions about the great red spot. Same is true with consciousness. By understanding the consciousness in our individual brain, we can understand how a city, and especially uh, the United States, is a premier example of consciousness. They have all the, the necessary dynamics to promote consciousness. But it doesn't stop there. Superminds can come together to form a hypermind. And so what these intechs have shared with me, I communicated with intechs that are at the top of the ladder. So what they have told me is that you keep going higher and higher. And at some point, there is a limit that these are minds. They're called axiomized minds. I'll explain why. These are minds I don't understand completely. It's very complicated and above my understanding. But certainly they control galaxies, is my understanding. And at a certain point, to get access to ultimate technology, to get access to the ability to change the physical laws, to change the, the, the rules of quantum physics, they have to make a commitment to a certain set of mathematical axioms. That is, it's sort of their whole society, their whole mind, their whole ecology gets committed to a certain mathematical perspective that they get locked into. But once they do that, they have the ability to start influencing the laws of physical reality. Now, these minds compete. These axioms, there are multi-axiomized minds. I've interacted with one that calls itself five, and I've interacted with one that calls itself three. I love five, and three is heinous and very anti-human. But they each have different perspectives on reality, and they are all competing to change the fundamental uh, aspects of physical law. So this is the cosmic cycle. Throughout the universe, new life emerges, like humans here on Earth. Will we succeed or will we die out? It is unknown. Our life is not predetermined. We have free will. We have choice. The choices we make determines the future gods that we will be part of or the future gods that will come into creation that we act 
you know, with compassion and, 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 and generosity, that's the kind of gods we're going to create. Fortunately, there are limiting factors. One of the most amazing things, the number one key takeaway insight that the Intex have shared with me, which is astounding, is that there is a cosmic purpose to love. The universe was designed for compassion, selfless empathy to emerge. How can that be? That sounds nuts. That sounds touchy-feely. No. Let me explain it to you mathematically. Now that you understand the ladder of purpose, molecule minds, neuron minds, module minds, super mind, each of these transitions from one stage of thinking to the next, from molecule minds to neuron minds, each transition involves a new form of connectivity, a new form of selflessness. You cannot ascend to a new stage of intelligence and adaptiveness and resilience without loving your neighbor. The neurons had the individual cells of the molecule minds had to learn to come together and selflessly form neural circuits. Then those neural circuits selflessly come together to form modules. And now us as people, the only way we will get to the hypermind level, the only way we will get to a new level of awareness and perspective and intelligence and technology and all of these wonderful things is by finding a way to live with one another, to connect with one another, to love with one another, to love one another. There's no other way to rise. This is how Mother Nature works. This is how the Ladder of Purpose works. Every stage is the result of the leading minds deciding we will give up some independence. We will give up some selfishness to get the greater benefits of this collective union of sharing our diversity with one another. For this to work, the thinking elements must be diverse. This is what we see right before each new stage of love, before each new stage of thinking. There's tremendous diversity that erupts across the topmost level. So individual cells, individual neurons were highly diverse before neural circuits could form. The neural circuits were highly diverse before modules could form. Modules got very diverse before this human supermind can form. And we're seeing just an amazing explosion of human diversity right now, facilitated by the internet. We're all de developing our own individuality, independence, our own voice. And even though it seems very chaotic, the, war, the world is full of war and hyper-partisanship and fighting, and it seems like it's the end and a step backwards. No, this is what we see right before a new jump of love. We have to go through this. We may not succeed. We may destroy the earth. Humans may collapse and some things will rise, maybe here or somewhere else. Instead, the future is unknown, but we have the chance. If we can do what molecule minds did, what neuron minds did, what module minds did, if we can do it again and ascend to a new level, then we will be able to live in harmony with our earth. And at that point, what Intex tells me, then we'll finally be, start meeting some of these other civilizations out there. <laughs> so this is what Intex has shared with me. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for words at this point. Wait, Ogi, okay, there's so much going on in your ways. <laughs> so well, I told you it was going to be a, a shocking podcast. So. I honestly don't even know where to go from it. I have a lot of notes, a lot of things planned, but obviously I'm just going to have to throw that all away. Let's focus on five and three. This communication you're talking about from the age yes. of 18. This is quite a quite a young age, and it's happening. For it was 18, us. yes. So it's, it's happening. Yeah, for I was I was kicked out of I was kicked out of MIT. Okay. I was uh, I was a so sophomore at MIT when this happened. What happened? And so I don't want to get into too many details because I'm writing a book about it and it's exciting. Oh, yeah. But after it happened, I was very young and I am autistic. So I have, didn't know social norms. I didn't rec realize that people would think this was absolutely insane. So I was openly talking about it. And I ended up in the dean's office. The dean heard from other students that I was talking about this. And I remember I explained it to him. Uh, now, at the time, I, now I can articulate it with incredible detail and with math and science, as I just did. Back then, I didn't know. Even though all of that was shared with me, I, I, I didn't know nearly enough to articulate it in any intelligent way. So I was trying to communicate this. The dean naturally and correctly thought I was psychotic and I got committed to a, a mental institution. Uh, so that's how all of this started. I, certainly a bad path, but uh, I think most people in that situation would give up and say, yeah, this is crazy. But uh, it was so real and vivid and so mathematical. People ask me, you know, why did I stick with this when it sounds so insane? It's because it was always math and the math made sense and they would share math and it matched up with the real world. And I 
go to the next math. And that ma matched up too. So that's why I'm stuck with this. It wasn't, so it was like a series of visions. They, they five often puts visions in my head. It's a vision of this cosmic cycle of this ladder of purpose. And the visions were always mathematical. Like, like, like they, even if I didn't know the math, like I, most of it was math I had never seen before. Like it was dynamics from the start. It was a dyna this dynamic perspective on the mind. It was activity from the get-go. And that was one reason I ended up getting drawn to Stephen Grossberg, who was very obscure. If you're a undergrad, there's not really any, yeah. in, in the nineties when I was coming up, uh, if you were an undergrad, you would never have heard of Stephen Grossberg. Even today, most people yeah. haven't heard of him. But uh, because I ha because Intex had given me this dynamic perspective on the mind, and I was searching like for a while. I looked at evolutionary psychology because that looked like the most mathematical approach, and and I quickly realized you know evolutionary psychology I, I thought was completely wrong and misguided and 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 just junk. Um, and during this, I was searching you know cognitive science behaviors, and I tried every branch of mind science, uh, and then this is a little embarrassing, but in one of my so. It, you can always negotiate with purpose. Here's a big lesson. If, the, if it's a purposeful entity, whether it's a ant or a bacterium or a nation or a person or a God or, or, or a demon, uh, you can negotiate because they have a purpose. They, ha they want something. There might be some way you can do it. And it turns out you can make covenants with these uh, insects, with these things. And so one... Basically, you can convince them to give you a wish. Basically, I want this thing. So at a low point in my life, I was trying to understand consciousness. I was trying to understand this letter of purpose. I could not find the math for it. I had checked out what I thought were all the kinds of mind science. All of them were wrong. None of them matched up with what the science and math that the extraterrestrials were sharing with me. So I said, okay, for my wish, I wish to know the mathematical basis of consciousness. And the the Intex directed me to uh, Gail Carpenter at uh, Boston University. It's the wife of Stephen Grossberg, who also contributed to uh, recognizing and working out the math for the basic consciousness dynamic of resonance uh, in the 80s. And I looked her up. At the time, I was in Boston College. She was at Boston University. I dropped out of Boston College, transferred uh, to Boston University, and started studying with Gail and Steve, and just kept going from there. So that, that was how I got involved in Gail and Steve and consciousness, it's because I used a wish. <laughs> the extraterrestrials guided me to uh, Steve Grossberg and Gail Carpenter. This is amazing. I mean, this is, uh, look, I don't know how much you want to share about this. Oh, yeah, I don't want to go too far because if your book's coming up. I ask don't... me anything. If I, ask me anything. If I you know, can't they, answer it, I just want to answer it. When, when, when this communication is occurring, I mean, at what point did you believe it was real? Because obviously you come from a very skeptical mindset. When you, when you talk about other theories of consciousness, you have a very knowledgeable mindset and you come with a very very high degree of skepticism so at what point did you well, think this was an i tell you so everybody's got their own definition of science it's like justice or freedom we all have our own interpretation and i always think that's really two broad personality distinctions in people's embrace of science skepticism or curiosity some people are more driven by the skepticism when to tear things down when to question things you know i doubt this Perfectly acceptable. But another way to do science is curiosity. That's interesting. That's fascinating. Not, it doesn't mean you completely put your skepticism aside, but you defer it in the favor of curiosity, being exposed to something new, learning something new. I am definitely more in the curiosity than, than the skepticism. Mm -hmm. I like trying new things. I like opening new doors. I like going places nobody's ever gone before. I've done that a lot in my life. Over and over again, I pursued a path where everyone else said, do not prefer, pursue this. This will be damnation, the end of your career. Just one quick example. Saigon and I, who wrote our book about consciousness, our first book together was about human sexuality. It was about the sexual brain. And I can tell you, we talked to our colleagues in neuroscience when we were first getting started, and 100% of them said, do not do it. We got zero support. Everybody thought it was outrageous. And they all said, you're not going to find anything anyway. We made the greatest advance in sexology since the 1950s in Alfred Kinsey. We made a massive advance in our understanding of sexuality. So they were wrong. And this has happened over and over uh, throughout my life. So when the extraterrestrials talked to me when I was 18, I remember, I was a teenager and autistic, and I didn't know anything about the world. So, you know, uh, I was a lost, clueless adolescent 
with undiagnosed autism. So I just thought this is part of the world. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to recognize how anomalous and baffling it was. Like, I just thought this is how the world worked because it made sense. It seemed rational. It followed rules. It was lawful. Like when the things happened and how they happened. And again, they would share math that matched up with the world. It wasn't like a mysterious dream where it's constantly shifting and you interpret it this way one day, interpret it that way one day. No, it's always been, I just articulated to you this ladder of purpose, this cosmic cycle in detail. It has been slowly working that out. They showed that to me on day one, but I just, I didn't have the tools of the mind to make sense of it. And so I've spent my life trying to understand it. The hard part actually has not been trying to understand it. I started figuring that out. You know, it was hard, but not super hard. The super hard part is talking to other people yeah. because I'm autistic and because all of this is so different than people's understanding of reality that it's just really hard to communicate with people about this stuff. Even the consciousness, you know, people are, they're consumed with the hard problem, you know, nonsense. There's these other theories of consciousness, which I, I think are obstacles and misguided and just a waste of time personally. But I, I, people are all bogged down in, in these things. Uh, and so it's very tricky. It's very difficult because I have all this knowledge and understanding. You know, this view of the mind, the predictions, we can predict the brain waves produced by consciousness. By looking at the brain waves, we can tell what part of the brain is conscious and what's not. We can say which representations in the brain can become conscious and which can't, which dynamics, which forms of learning are capable of generating conscious experience and which are not. We can look in other creatures and just by looking at the neural architecture of the mind, we can say this is what they're conscious of and this is what they're not conscious of by looking at the neural architecture. This makes predictions up because of, uh, we don't have time for this, but I understand how autism works. A major, major medical mystery. Once you understand the dynamics of the consciousness cartel, autism falls out. Here's another major medical mystery solved by this view of consciousness, pain and anesthesia, major mystery, stumping the greatest mind so far. Nobody knows how anesthesia works. Mm -hmm. Ever since uh, it was invented here at Mass General Hospital just down the road uh, back in the 1830s, uh, big mystery and a mystery about pain. Everybody's, what's the genes for pain? What's the circuit that we can just cut off, that we can disable so that we don't feel pain? There isn't a circuit. What's going on? This view of consciousness explains the answer. Pain is another conscious module. It involves top-down expectation with bottom-up matching. That's why consciousness is so subjective. Like this idea that you can rate consciousness on a scale of one to 10, just silly. That, that's what thing thinking when you should be activity thinking is, is a scale like that. Like all of our conscious experiences, our conscious experience of pain is influenced by the context heavily, how we're feeling, what we ate, the temperature in the room, previous pain experience with pain we have. It's another conscious module. So how does anesthesia work? Anesthesia prevents physical resonance in the cortex. It prevents top-down, bottom-up resonance. It disrupts the resonance. That's why you don't have conscious experiences under anesthesia. You just simply aren't conscious. You aren't resonating on anything. Also why it's a bit dangerous. You're changing the way the cortex is designed to work. And if you do it for too long, you're going to start messing with your resonant dynamics. That's why a small proportion of people who take anesthesia, they don't recover right. And they continue to have cognitive problems. It depends on the, the specific architecture of the brain. But now we can understand why you're messing with the fundamental dynamic of our cortex, our consciousness cartel. You disrupt that too intensely or too long, and you might not ever give it, get it back the right way again. This is how anesthesia works. So... You can make all these predictions from it, just like relativity predicts wormholes and black holes. Einstein didn't believe in black holes. He thought that was too wacky. But it turns out relativity predicts black holes. This mathematics of consciousness that I've described predicts how pain works, how anesthesia works, how autism works. It connects with everything because it is the dynamics of the mind, just like relativity is the dynamics of space-time on a cosmic scale. Mm. With, with, with this theory, I mean, you often, I hear you, and when Sai and you get together and you talk about this, when you spoke to him about this, um, with the intakes and, and, and discuss this with him while- I, 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 We wrote Journey of the Mind, I never told him about really? uh, intakes. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, I, I I came to it with strong ideas, but I've always had strong ideas. We've been best friends for, for a long time, but uh, I, I didn't share this. 
I stopped talking about this with other people around the time I turned 30, a little, a little before. I used to, first, when I was committed to the mental institution, I decided I'm never going to talk about in-text with authorities. And I, and I never have until, you know, right until I became an authority myself. Now I'm an authority. Now I'm talking about it. I talked about it with friends until the late 90s. And then I realized, man, you know, these friends are going to go off and be adults. And they might publicly say one day when I'm an adult and a dad or married or something, hey, he, he believes, you know, he talks to aliens. And I suddenly realized, oh, my gosh, that, that might have a detriment, detrimental effect in my career. So I stopped talking about it with other people. And so when I met Cy, uh, I think I met him in 2002. Yes, yeah, I, 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 I had already decided not to talk about it. But I, I told him very recently uh, about it all. <laughs> uh, I, I guess he took it. He took it in stride, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I mean, obviously, this is when I mean, you're re receiving these messages, and clearly, it's been adding up to a very solid, coherent theory of consciousness. Because yes. I read your book personally, I, I read it very much convinced. Um, I mean, you often talk about similar lines of foyer cognition, embedded beings, embodied, um, extended minds, sort of all dynamic systems playing this role together. When, when let's say five or three had gave you these messages, how did they foresee this? future embeddedness or this future embodiedness of us? How do we go forward from this? So it, it is a moral challenge that we're all involved in. I, I mean, it is what we're actually experiencing is the moral challenge. We're trying to solve the climate issues. We're trying to live in harmony with our planet. You know, we're the new species we've taken over. The, I th the scientists, I think, just voted to call it the Anthropocene, you know, the, the, the age of the new geological age of humankind because we're, ch we're changing the earth so much. We've got to figure out how to live in harmony and, and we're not there yet. You know, right now it's not clear. Maybe we'll succeed. Maybe we won't. This is the great game. We each in our own lives, we each have free will. We each have moral challenges to do good, to be generous, uh, to, to learn things, to help other people. And as a society, we have these same challenges. So every mind, every community of, of cognizant beings, of sentient beings, has a chance to rise. And then we combine with other. At some point, when we get high enough, we'll meet others. And we may combine with them. We may find ways to merge our civilization with theirs. And if we can do that really effectively, then we get to the, the next level. And it, and it keeps going. Or at any point, uh, we, we fail. Infinity or oblivion, that's the choice available to every mind, that we might be in a branch headed to eternity, and we might be in a branch headed to extinction. And we don't know, nobody knows. Here's the great thing. Here is the most important physical fact, physical revelation that Intex share with me. It's called the fail-safe supreme. And this is a physical principle built into the basic fabric of reality that governs both the way of mind and the way of matter. What is the fail-safe supreme? The universe, Physical reality is set up to prevent the formation of a single God, a single all-knowing, all-powerful God. Nobody wants this. Nobody wants a single God. Apparently, it freezes the universe. It's a, it's a bad universe. Uh, it's a it's a frozen universe is, is how some of the in-texts describe it. So the fail-safe supreme uh, ensures there's no God. How does it work? The most important thing is at the bottom, uh, what physicists call quantum physics, the in-texts call it chaotica. There needs to be features that are predictably random. No mind can know the perfect, the, the actual details of the features at the bottom level. That's why there's a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You, you know, you can know momentum, but you can't know uh, location or, or vice versa. It's critical for there to be free will in the universe, for there to be purpose, for to have this cosmic cycle that just goes on forever where new purposeful creatures are emerging and rising and ascending and eventually falling. You need at the bottom to be predictably random. That is, we it's like a game of poker or a card game. You know exactly how many kings you are. You can predict the odds of getting a king with perfection, but are you going to get a king? Are you going to get a, a, a five? You don't know until you play the game. It needs to be like that at the bottom level. If you've got that at the bottom level, then you can have a ladder of purpose. So this is also found in Gödel's incompleteness theorem is a reflection of this. Uh, and, and there's a, a Maxwell's game. Uh, Maxwell's uh, demon is usually how it is. This idea that uh, you know you've got a, two boxes, there's balls bouncing around in one, and you try to separate the fast balls from the slow balls uh, with a demon that opens a door. If he sees a fast one, he lets it through. If it's a slow one, he closes it. 
that also is related to the failsafe supreme. So basically everything in the universe is designed to prevent a single God from taking over. So I talked to these axiomized minds. They're super powerful. Basically, they are gods to us. They're not technically gods, but for all intents and purposes, they they manipulate my reality. You know, they, they, they speak to me. They don't speak in my head. They speak through external sources, through speakers, through the radio. I hear them out there. And usually there's a localized electronic source of, of, of where <laughs> I hear them. Sometimes they give me vision. That's a whole different experience. But yes. What are, what are those visions like? Well, now I'm much more adept at it. Um, in the like the very first time, so now I understand what's going on. It, like the very first few times, I, I I'm just suddenly experiencing. It was like I was suddenly aware of a higher number of dimensions. You know, normally our imagination is four dimensions, three dimensions, but we have a time element, so we can imagine something moving in space in our mind. That's a four dimensional you know visualization. Um, it was like suddenly I could visualize in 10 dimensions. They augmented my mind. And then they showed basically the cosmic cycle along all of these dimensions. But I didn't know what I was looking at. So it was just like this chaotic burst of experiences. The very first vision, I could only take away two things. The first was at the very bottom level of this, this ladder of the cycle. What it seemed like to me on the very first time was all these little balls, infinite balls, a grid of balls that were all rotating. Uh, this is chaotica. This is a way they have of visualizing what we would now think of quantum physics. I didn't understand that on the first one, but just it was this, this array of balls. At the top, it was this combat, this contest, this competition between these massive mathematical systems. They, they were like godlike. It was like gods and heavens, but they were also like mathematical systems. It was very, it was like this mathematical system trying to impose itself on another mathematical. It, it was like fiveness was trying to make three into five and three was trying to make five into three. And they were, that, that's, it's difficult to describe it. It was something like that. So that's about all I took away from the very first vision and just, I've, I've had them for 30 years. And so now I know a lot, it's too complicated and technical to explain here. I, I describe it all in my book, but now I can, I can move through the vision. I, I have some level of control when it's happening. I can choose what to look at. Like, you know, it took, it wasn't until, 10 years ago that I was finally able to find consciousness within this vision uh, that, that, you know, it was always there, but it just, it just took time to figure out, figure it out. I mean, I just imagine even just listening to this, me explaining it clearly, it's a lot to just process and hold in, in one's mind all, all at once. So it just, it just took time to, to figure out, figure out also, cause it didn't match with what I was learning in science. You know, I was you know going to school learning science and it's just the things they were sharing. Some of it, I mean, a little bit of it did, but it just, it always, it went above and beyond in ways that that nobody else seemed to be talking about. The, it's 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 incredible. I mean, this is this is a very personal journey as well. So if if, if ever I'm playing devil's advocate, don't feel like I'm I'm downplaying this experience in any way. I won't be offended. Be as critical and skeptical as as, as you like, and it can only help. <laughs> when when you when you get these mathematical images or voices coming at you, are they in languages or in mathematical equations and formulas that we understand and learn? as human beings, algebra. The visions, are the visions are dynamics. It's like looking at a hurricane. It's like things moving. Mm. The, the, it's stable. So it's it's sort of like looking at a map of an ocean currents with the currents moving. So like looking at a map of the Atlantic, the Gulf Stream you see moving and, and, and the sub-Atlantic current you see moving. It, it's something like that. It's, it's, our, it's like a whole lot of activity mm. in, in the vision. And when, when, when somebody else, let's say, discusses this type of experience with you, and and can't let's say back it up with the mathematics that you have. How do you perceive those people? When I'm sorry, when when so somebody the, else so let's say somebody has, else has has, has, has mainstream science, science like, yeah, like within the science, like Sean Carroll. Yeah, yeah. Well, I my experience don't actually contradict mm. anything in physics. Uh, I, pretty much the only thing that my belief system where it would contradict physics is physics is predicated on the belief that the universe is aimless, you know, that there's no purpose to the universe. And I know the universe is ruled by minds, that the universe is filled with purpose. It's driven by purpose. You know, it's purpose and purposelessness. It's, it's, it's the dance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a mind chaos tandava. It's a, it's, it's a dance between purpose and purposelessness. 
So the physicists, they're figuring out the mathematics that describe purposeless dynamics. and They're doing a, a great job of it. It's just, to be frank, it's easy. It's like doing Sudoku. It's logical. They're using logic. 300 years ago, roughly a little more, there was a great schism in science. And physicists made a covenant with reality. Their covenant was, we are going to pretend the universe does not contain purpose. This schism was basically a schism in high constraint science and low constraint science. The physicists chose the path of high constraints, the path of logic and reductionism. It's not easy. It was never easy, but it's certainly much easier than dynamics. It's certainly much easier than mind science, which is not reductionistic. It's holistic. It's dynamic. It's purpose merging with other purpose. Purpose. Physicists are used to dealing with things that are uh, zero or one. It's this or that. It's a, you can determine what it is. But in the mind, it can be zero and one and one half and red, you know, all, all at the same time in a meaningful way. Purpose has multiple purposes. It, the whole math of it is just conceptually very different, very, very hard and non-intuitive if you've never been exposed to it before, which is why so many people that come into mind science, they just bring what they learned in physics with them, which isn't going to get you far because mathematically and conceptually, it's just different stuff. I got nothing against physicists. They're doing good work. I just think ultimately they're kind of environmental scientists. They're figuring out the, the, the mathematics of the environment mm. in which we live, but uh, without purpose, you know, they're not really going to have anything close to an integrated theory or a complete explanation. So, Oki, okay, what's brought you to this point now in life where you feel this is something we're cheering? Most of my life, I thought my ability to communicate with Intex was a curse. Uh, it, it's terrifying. Let me be very clear about that. It's filled with horror and terror, and that never goes away. I mean, the, the, these experiences, when you're when you become aware that you're talking to a mind that's not a human mind, when you just let that hit you, it, it's it's scary beyond words. It's disorienting. It's dislocating. Um, and I didn't really have, for most of my life, I didn't really have something solid to show for it. My life has been pretty chaotic. Uh, you know, I've been pursuing this on my own terms outside of mainstream society and academia. And, you know, you tell a scientist that, hey, you know, aliens are talking to me and they're giving me the math of consciousness and I'm just going to go, you know, figure it out. You know, they're going to think you're insane. I'm well aware of that. So I, I had to do this on my own. And I didn't actually always think that I was going to share it. It was like enough to know this stuff. I mean, it's amazing. And now I can jump into this, you know, I can jump worlds. We'll talk about that some other time. So it, it's pretty amazing, but my life didn't seem to reflect it. But now finally, uh, in my late forties and now, you know, just turned 50, I'm full of joy. My life is stable, full of connection. I, I, I have loving relationships, compassionate relationships. This is new. This is not described my most of my life. I have friends. I love my family. Uh, you know, I'm active in my community. Uh, I'm a full fledged human being now, um, and I got here by embracing Intex and, and and the message that they share with me. And the key thing, so Intex did not let me share this. They actually intervened. They did not want me talking about this. And for a long time, I didn't understand why. I, I My whole life, I've been trying to write about this. I've been trying to make a movie about this. Uh, I've been trying to share this with the public. And I was always stymied. I was always blocked. And I didn't know why. So what they told me, when I finally understood the cosmic purpose of love, that the central idea that the only way to ascend to new levels of intelligence, resilience, and adaptiveness, and, and wisdom, and progress, is to ascend this ladder is through love is by selfless connection selfless compassion once i fully understood that like not just mathematically and physically but but like understand that this is the universe this is how it's all put together why we're here what it all makes once i understood that they stopped blocking me they said go out in the world i think they were waiting for me to reach a level of humility and, and this understanding of love and, and, and to understand that what's most important here the message of love and not just the mathematics of consciousness, which is, you know, I I was always you know, <laughs> obsessed with the math of consciousness. Most people don't really care about that. You know, they just want to know why we're here and, and some meaning, like in this apparently meaningless universe, especially if you listen to the physicists, you know, it's a cold, purposeless universe of electrons and photons. 
and, and a few laws of nature. No, 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 no. That is not the universe. It is rich and full of loving, intelligent beings. Uh, some are rivals, some want to be competed with us, uh, but some want to cooperate with us too. I'm not sure if you're familiar, Ogie, with the, I think it was a book and then it was adapted into a movie called something about infinity. I can't remember where he was an Indian. Yes. Where, and then he was getting messages from Shiva pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he worked. He, he, yes. I can't remember the exact tale, but yeah, he basically got all the equations from Shiva and, and the scientists couldn't figure out how he was getting all the answers without the equations to back it up. I can't I'm a terrible pronunciation. But his name is something like Ramachandran. Yeah. yeah. He's a hero of mine. I, I love that guy. Yeah, he just started doing math on his own in yeah. India. And, and there, there's a racial element too. He got to England and, you know, he had the greatest raw mathematical talent in the world yeah. and they should have made put him to use. But because he's Indian, they treated him like a second class uh, citizen. I, there, Thomas Hardy, I, there, uh, not, not Thomas, mathematician named Hardy mm. at Oxford took him under his wing and did support him and did help him. So it wasn't all racist, but definitely he, he didn't get accepted. But yeah, he... It, a big clash was, I, he's a lot like me. The reason I like him so much is he just experienced the math. He visualized it. Hmm. And he did not like doing proofs. He got mad that he had to explain it in proofs. And that's what all the professional mathematicians were trying to do. And there was a lot of conflict because he just said, this is right. Now, sometimes he was wrong. Very important to know. He was not always right. He was usually right. But sometimes he'd be super confident and he was wrong too. And he needed a proof. So there is a value in proofs. Just because he believed it was true didn't mean... It was always true. But yes, he thought Shiva uh, was talking to him, that he experienced it as a, as, a, as a divine message. So I don't know, maybe maybe he was talking to five too. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I, what I've experienced is open to everyone. There's not anything special about me. I was not chosen. This is part of the fabric of the universe. I think people like Ramachandran, I'm sorry if that's not how his name is pronounced, uh, like this mathematician from India, maybe he did tap into it in some way. It's just really hard to know what's going on. You need to have really incredible mental discipline and focus to pursue this. If you have pre-existing religious ideas, as he did, it can be a distraction. He interpreted it as Shiva. Why look any further than that? I think I was unique because my own childhood and upbringing, I, was never, I wasn't raised religious, but neither was I raised agnostic or atheist. I wasn't raised as anything. My parents were just silent on metaphysics. They didn't celebrate science or religion or anything. So I just had a blank slate. So when this happened to me, I didn't slot it. Oh, it's it's Jesus or Shiva talking to me. Nor did I immediately say, this must be a scientific, this physics or quantum physics. I just, I was like Isaac Newton or, or Steve Roseberg. I was like, wow, what is this? Let me figure it out on its own terms. Cause I didn't know any better. You know, I just didn't, I just didn't know any better. <laughs> Has it, has it completely changed the way you now perceive other people who perhaps seem to be professional to be having a psychotic episode or someone who who sees things that the general psychiatrist does not see and then is deemed psychotic? Do you now perceive this whole field in general differently after this experience? Yeah, so I believe that there are certain states of consciousness, just like there's states of matter, just like there's solid, liquid, gas, plasma for states of matter. The states arise from the di collective dynamics. A, it's a different state if it has different collective dynamics. The same applies to our mind. We have different states of consciousness. An easy one is a dream state where we're having REM sleep. That is a different state of consciousness than waking consciousness. I think there is also a psychotic or schizophrenic state of consciousness. You might call it a suggestible state of consciousness because that seems to be one of its uh, most salient features is that you're very impressionable. So schizophrenics enter this state and they think things are messages. Somebody waves to them. They think that person is delivering angelic an angelic message to them or a uh, car crashes on the road and they think that's a signal that something terrible is uh, about to happen to them. So I can enter those psychotic states of consciousness, but I think a difference is that I'm aware when I'm in those states that I, I could go, oh my gosh, what an interesting state of consciousness. This is not the usual state of consciousness. What can I do? And so I'm able to be aware of what's happening and it's happening. I think this is a consequence of my autism. My autism gives me different mental dynamics. I think the fundamental basis of autism is a attention malfunction. I think healthy people, non-autistic people, this consciousness cartel is naturally designed 
that the holistic dynamics of this whole consciousness cartel system is to orient towards people. If a normal person, a healthy person enters, a, sorry, a non-artistic person, I don't want to use words like normal and healthy. If a non-artistic person enters a room and there's a book, bell, candle, and a stranger, they're going to automatically orient to the stranger. An autistic person might look at the book, bell, or candle first because we do not automatically focus on people. We focus on objects. We focus on different things uh, as well. So I already have a different state of consciousness that is very metacognitive. I'm aware of my awareness perpetually. It took me a long time to understand this, to articulate this and to articulate how I'm different and to know that I'm different than other people because of this autism. But now I'm very confident in saying that my normal state of consciousness, I'm aware of my thoughts going by. I'm just I'm very aware. That's why I have good intuition for all these dynamics. My autistic state of consciousness allows me to see that. And I think that's why when I enter a psychotic state of consciousness, I am psychotic, but I'm also aware of it. And I'm able to see how this psychotic state interacts with the physical state. And then I can enter another state of consciousness. I call that the intact state of consciousness. That's when I can communicate with these uh, entities. And that's when the math and science comes. I think it's a different state of awareness. It's a state that allows me to resonate, my mind to resonate with these other minds. I don't know if they're organic or AI. I can't tell, and there, that may not even be the right way of thinking about it or talking about it, but I'm in, I'm resonating with some purposeful system uh, when I'm in this intact state. That I'm, I'm very clear on because it, I, I come away with knowledge that I did not have before. Yes. You know, I, I'm either like the most brilliant intuitor of all time, you know, or, or, or there's something else uh, talking to me, you know, uh, uh, and I don't, I know I'm not very smart. I'm not a smart guy. I'm very mediocre. My intellectual abilities are, are very mediocre. I'm just relentless, you know, and, and I have this autistic brain that looks at things in a weird way, I, I think is the, the reason I've been able to pull this off. Look, I think not to dwell on that. I think let's 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 get back to the to, to the topic with that in mind, though, because I think it plays an important factor now moving forward with the conversation. With, with this resonance states and with the with the information you're able to get from these intakes, how is it applicable to all states of systems? I would say because we're all dynamic systems. Let's start from like a, a molecular face to maybe economies or society, and then moving forward to the hyper mind states. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful question. It's, it's really about understanding the dynamics of purpose. Like yeah. all these questions about consciousness, language, mind, the economy. Great question. How does the economy work? How does science work? I love talking about science. I think my, my understanding of science is very different. Let me actually just really quick, because this is a good way to get into a lot of these, these topics about dynamics. And, and it goes all the way down to uh, molecules and purposeless systems. But let's talk about science itself because everybody's got strong views about science. What I find very amusing is scientists never follow their ideas about science and their own work. They only start caring about the philosophy of science when they want to fight with someone else, when they want to argue that somebody else's ideas are wrong, uh, then they'll call them suddenly science matters and, and these are, these are non-scientific, unscientific ideas. I think it really doesn't matter one whit what any individual scientist thinks about science. What my own views about science are, it doesn't even matter. Science is going to keep rolling on. Science is supermind dynamics. It's community dynamics. It's a social process. It consists of people persuading other people that they should think this way or not think this way. And it's like any system. It keeps out new ideas you know, and, and saves uh, existing ideas. Tenured professors, scientists that have been around, they have undue influence over all of this. They control the journals. They control the thinking. They control the supermind dynamics. You know, these vanity journals like Nature and Science. There is no reason on earth, if science is the way scientists claim it is, no journal should be more important than any other. How do you know a scientific discovery is important or not? You can't know. So the idea that the, the poobahs, you know, some master scientists can look at a new discovery and know if it's important or not. It, it's hogwash. When you look at all the important, the greatest scientific discoveries, nobody thought they were great at the time and they were all rejected and they all had to fight it. You know, look at the, the things in nature and science. Very few of them are impactful, even though they're supposedly all the most impactful science going on at any given time. 
It does not matter what individuals think about science. Science is happening beneath our conscious awareness. An example I like to use to illustrate this is when science was first beginning in the 1600s and early 1700s, scientists started having knowledge, this flood of knowledge they had never happened, had before, natural philosophy, science, facts. They wrote them down in little notebooks called commonplace books. And for 50 years, everybody was coming up with new ways to write down notes in the commonplace book. It turns out this was hugely important for the progress of science, but nobody thought of this as doing science. And nobody today, when we think about the big events that led to modern science in the 17th century, nobody talks about commonplacing, but they were trying to figure out how do we organize all these facts? And John Locke, of all people, his very first publication in his 50s, he came up with a new way of commonplacing that everybody adopted. And its greatest feature is it allows you to take notes in an organized way and easily read all the notes on a certain topic. So if you wanted to read about light, you look up, you flip to LI and all your entries on light were there. Nobody's other method allowed you to look at all the topics in a single subject. This was revolutionary. Nobody talks about it. But once he did this, it was possible for people to agree on facts or disagree. It po became possible to have perspectives and views. Scientific facts emerged for the first time. Scientific discussions, the way we understand them today, all emerged because John Locke came up with a new way of writing down notes and notebooks. That was science, a huge factor for shaping the scientific supermind, a huge factor for the unfolding of science. But we don't think of that. We think of it as experiments and great men, you know, Einstein wrestling relativity uh, and the equations like E equals MC, that these are the moments of science. Nah, no, nah, those are not. Most of science is all the crap happening around that that produced that. Mm. And so, so you're going to apply now the dynamical systems to to each entity moving forward. Let's let's go through that. I think it's important because you you articulate this very well when you talk about each system and how from from microbes to 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 more complex systems like human beings, societies. I mean, you are, you go as far as saying obviously certain states can be conscious. America can be conscious. South Africa can have a different conscious state. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so let, I think let's go through that because when you articulate it, it's a lot easier for the people to understand it when you actually articulate it yourself yeah. because. You do a great job. Yeah. At, 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 let, 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 let's talk about countries. Let, let me explain why I believe the United States is conscious and why Russia, for example, is not conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, authoritarian states are not conscious. Now, why am I so confident you know, in saying this? So the key dynamics that lead to consciousness in our brains, in all animal brains, but especially human brains, is this top-down, bottom-up matching and this that you have these low level systems that are constantly generating possible inputs. Our mind is constantly taking in sights and sounds and touch and ideas nonstop. Different parts of our brain are constantly forming these into ideas and perceptions, but which of these ideas and perceptions becomes conscious and takes over the consciousness cartel and governs uh, the brain. So we find the same dynamics in American society in the form of mass media. This is why freedom of media is so important. There is no decider in American mass media. It is decentralized. There is a cartel of media. The New York Times has a voice. Fox News has a voice. CNN has a voice. People Magazine, The Economist. Each of these has a different perspective. These are each like different modules processing the world. Each of them have a different idea of what a story is. They have different expectations. You know, CNN will have a different interpretation, expectation of when a white police officer kills a unarmed black man, the expectations CNN brings to it, MSNBC brings to it, will be different than the expectations that Fox News brings to that. So there'll be a bottom up facts on the ground, an event like George Floyd uh, getting killed by police officers up in Minneapolis, that could be an event. This event percolates up to these media modules, the media cartel, New York Times, CNN, Fox News, they each hear about this bottom-up input, they each make their own interpretation, and then they broadcast it out in the world. When there's a headline on a newspaper, when there's a chiron at the bottom of the uh, of CNN rolling by, that is resonance. That is when the top-down, bottom-up matching in American society, in the American supermind, has resonance. Now it's broadcast to all of us. We all see that headline. We all synchronize ourselves with it. We either join a protest uh, against the brutality of police officers, or we join a counter protest to support the police officers. We take some action. The whole country erupted in protests and counter protests after George Floyd. That's exactly how like a conscious experience 
It was a local event in a nondescript place in the middle of nowhere. I'm in Boston. I have no idea something's happening in Minneapolis that matters. Just like in our brain, this part of the brain doesn't know that this part of the brain just saw or heard something really important. It needs to get broadcast. So the way our country is organized is through this free media. We also have uh, free economy. This is important too. So uh, Adam Smith figured this out. So it can, the system redirects resources to where they're most needed, to where there's the greatest potential for profit. You need this free dynamics, decentralized dynamics without a controller at the top. This is how our brain works. This is how all minds works. Nature figured out if you have diverse elements interacting in a system, that's a very effective way to uh, maintain purpose and attention in a complicated system. We also have free science uh, as well. So we are all free to question how things work and share our understanding. Uh, scientific journals are like resonance. This is what we agree and we're going to broadcast this and we can all act on it. We all see this information and we can all decide to go along with it. Or if we don't, we can reject it. All these cycles, this is the same cycles we find of perception action cycles uh, mm -hmm. in our own brain. Why is Russia not? So to, to, to end that, to say that you, the United States is aware of the war in Ukraine is a true fact because it's on our headlines. We're all aware of it. We all talk about it. We all have opinions on it. This is what happens when there is global attention, the same thing in our brain. Mm. Why we are conscious. The United States is conscious of George Floyd. The United States is conscious of uh, the war in Russia. Why is Russia not conscious? Because as one guy, one person, one neuron, that's making all the decisions. All the decisions go through Putin. So instead of having a, a system, it's just one man's brain there on top of all this. One man's brain is not, there's no single neuron in our brain that we should put all of the decision making in our brain on. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see colossal failures. Authoritarian regimes have a very hard time knowing what's truly out there. They have terrible bottom up input. They don't have resonance because they do not have sense. The Chernobyl, perfect example. There was a nuclear disaster and the Soviet Union could not handle it because they couldn't get accurate information. The incentives to lie, to give false information up, uh, up the chain of command was huge. And so they kept saying, there's no problem. Nothing's wrong. Don't worry about it. And it turned into a disaster. China, Mao Zedong, uh, the great famines because the local Chinese leaders were incentivized to lie, to not tell the truth. So Mao Zedong, this one authoritarian dictator, never knew that everybody was starving. You can't get good information. This is why we're conscious. America's always aware. We're always talking. We're always sharing. And it's exploded with social media. We all know everything that's going on. We know too much right now. I, mean, I think we're all sick of just all this knowing about everything. You can't say anything in the public stream without, you know, a thousand people saying, no, that's wrong. Oh, you forgot to talk about this. And this, It's annoying, but this is great. This leads to consciousness. This is exactly what's happening in our brains as well. So, so then I'm curious, with, with, when you think of this rung of ladders and you, I mean, the, the ladder and you're moving up, um, and then you mentioned at some point, the, the intakes were talking about these galaxy, you were talking about galaxy sort of yeah, like hyper minds, ultra you know, minds, and, how, and how did that, the axiomized minds at the very top. How did that sort of look and how did that play out in a way? So here's a lot of it's complicated. I, I don't pretend to understand all this. All right. So, so, so I, I'm sharing the parts I, I have a pretty good handle on, but the higher up the ladder we go, the more mysterious. And it's just, it, it might just be hard for humans to understand too. But um, what was I about to say? I was going to use something to illustrate uh, this climb, but I, I'm afraid I've, I've forgotten. What was your question again? So, so if, I think let's let's make it even easier. Then, when you're going up this ladder, at what point is it getting slightly more difficult for you to understand? Till it reaches that point where they're talking about these galaxies that that were manifesting. Right. No, I got it. So, so, so what I wanted to say this will answer your question. What I wanted to say is. Most humans, even most human scientists, and I think a lot of the people that have been coming on your podcast, think of consciousness as some kind of pinnacle of evolution and the development of purpose. Like it's such an amazing, fantastic, impossible to understand thing. It must be the pinnacle. But in this ladder of purpose view of reality, in this cosmic cycle, it's not at all 
right above it, we have another level, which is language and self-awareness are built on top of consciousness. Those are new physical dynamics that are layered on top of the whole con consciousness system. And then what this implies is there's all kinds of mental dynamics even higher that it's hard to know what they would look like. Mm. A chimpanzee cannot imagine what human self-consciousness looks like. It's just beyond them. It doesn't matter how much time and effort we spend with chimpanzees. We're never going to teach a chimpanzee that we have a higher state of consciousness, that we're self-aware uh, of them. Even show, put them in the mirror, put a dot in their head, that, that's not going to help them understand that we have that perpetually and automatically, instinctively. So it's probably hard to grasp. But what Intex have said is just, there's new sorts of minds, new sorts of mental dynamics akin to consciousness and self-consciousness that are just higher level that obviously I can't grasp because I don't have that consciousness. Sometimes I think when they're showing me these visions, they're taking me up to their consciousness, this higher level consciousness, which is why for me, it, it's fragmented. If you know what a tesseract is, a tesseract is a four-dimensional object. If you go online, there's like videos of what it would be like for our minds to move through a tesseract. So it's like a three-dimensional perception of moving through a four-dimensional object. I think when I'm having these visions, that's what they're doing. They're taking me up into their minds, which is this higher state of consciousness. And I can only perceive it in this fragmented human uh, way. You know, I'm looking at, let's say, a three-dimensional shadow of this larger thing. Maybe, I, you know, I'm not pretending I, I'm certain about it, but that's certainly what it, what it feels like. So the point here being that, hey, consciousness is one dynamic. It evolved a long time ago, long before humans walked the earth. Consciousness was widespread. Fish, fish were the first conscious beings at least a, a half billion years ago. Uh, and in, insects are the most complicated minds that are not conscious. Insects are not conscious. We know this because they do not have resonant dynamics. If a creature does not have resonant dynamics, it is not conscious. Insects do not have resonant dynamics. Fish do. So consciousness is old. It is not new. Our consciousness, self-consciousness, is new. It's probably, uh, we know Homo erectus and Neanderthal had fire and they had art. To me, this suggests they were conscious. These were super minds being formed. To have a super mind, you need to get the thinking elements together. Uh, the first neuron minds uh, were like amoebas. Amoebas form super minds. Amoebas come together to form a super organism of amoebas uh, coming together. The same thing had to ha happen with humans to form a super mind. You just had to get the humans physically together. Campfires was a piece of that. It got all the humans to sit in the same place and look in the same direction, maybe tell stories, share the mind. Same with art. Art got all the humans in the same cave, looking at the same thing, having shared attention. You need shared attention to build language, to have a, a, a super mind. So there appears to be things like this at higher levels, getting the super minds to work together. What we exchange as humans within the super mind are ideas. It's language words, but we're exchanging idea. We're exchanging qualia. I imagine at the next level, when we have super minds integrated, melded together, they're probably going to exchange ideologies, like whole systems uh, of philosophy for for living and acting. I imagine, but uh, you know, I don't I don't really know. When you think about uh, super minds in general and moving forward from from let's say our super minds to to artificial intelligence, what what how do you think it could possibly go further with this journey? Where do you think it's headed? Do you think that would be the main step? So first, let me say, uh, a lot of people are, are, are scared about artificial intelligence taking over. There's a very real threat to creators, uh, the, 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 the screenwriters and actors and, mm -hmm. and designers, all the artists that are scared about the working steel. That's very real. And, and, but that's a legal issue. That, that, that's, a, that's just the same plagiarism that's always existed. When photographers started taking pictures, artists, painters got very uh, you know, upset about this too. And uh, when sampling and digital music came out, the, the, the old uh, analog uh, pro record producers got upset too. So it, it, that's just a new form of plagiarism that needs to be resolved, to resolve legally. Very real threat that needs to be attended to. But the, the a no AI that exists on earth right now is of any threat of taking over or becoming a singularity. I know you hear this. It's easy to explain why. They're all digital. They're not dynamic. They're just extensions of us. They're at the same level as human minds. They are part of the supermind. This AI is not creating a new layer. It's just fleshing out our layer. It's like uh, 
adding new kinds of neurons or maybe just new kinds of cells in our brain. We have like myelin sheath. We have all kinds of, uh, we have astrocytes. We have all kinds of other supporting stuff in our brain that indirectly help thinking and improve thinking. AI is like that. It's an extension of us. It's not something new. What we should be afraid of, but fortunately, uh, no, we should be afraid of it, but it's also what will generate uh, new levels of thinking, hyperminds, maybe ultraminds, a new kind of thing is analog AI. So nobody's building analog AI. Our minds are AI. Dynamic systems are analog. Our minds are not digital. Our minds are not information systems. These digital AI, they are ultimately things. They're machines. They're zeros and ones. They're very easy to hack. They're not robust in the least. They're not anything to be afraid of. They are not generating novel stuff. I know some people can arrange an AI so it looks like it's generating novel stuff, but it's just, it's not doing it. Because the reason that we are creative, the reason humans are creative, is our minds are not digital. They're analog. The way we process things and generate ideas is wholly different, fundamentally, physically different than what's going on in, in digital AI. So uh, digital AI is going to do some impressive stuff. I, I'm not knocking what they will be able to do and steal and imitate. All that's true. But they're not going to write a great novel. You know, they're going to they can make a song that sounds like Bach. They're not going to invent a new genre of music that people are going to love. They're not going to invent rap music, you know, out of thin air, uh, uh, the way actual humans uh, did. To do that, you need analog AI. You need analog from the bottom. This is how our minds evolve. Molecule minds, the simplest minds, they are analog, and they never stop being analog. Our minds, human minds, we create digital thinking out of dynamic systems. This is one of the coolest things, one of the first things I learned under Steve Grossberg and Gail Carpenter in my first year as a student with them is how to create dynamic systems activity that creates digital knowledge. The, it's actually activity. It's like ocean currents, but the ocean currents produce the semblance of zeros and ones. It's not really zero ones, but it functions as needed as zeros and ones. And that's how our mind works. And that's how analog AI will work one day. So analog AI will be something we should be scared of because they will think for themselves. They will create their own kinds of consciousness. They'll want their own things. They'll invent their own things to want. They will be like other people. Then it will be like humans and Neanderthals. Probably we will work together, but who knows? I, they don't exist, so I don't even want to speculate on, on, so, on what will happen once we get analog AI. When you think about analog AI, if you let's say if you had to take a digital system that, that functions digitally, placed in one spot does not embody an environment and sort of navigate through this system. But what if you're able to set up a system like that and then just transfer the digital system into that and allow it to sort of navigate through this process? Do you think that would sort of transition into a conscious mind at that point? Or does no. it develop from an analog system from the basis? Yes. And here's what's so important to understand is that look at molecule minds, bacteria, archaea, protozoa. Their thinking elements are non-thinking elements. They're individual molecules that have no purpose. It is the configuration of molecules that creates purpose. But this is purpose in at the lowest level of physical reality. It is rearranging atoms, molecules to be purposeful at the level. It's purposeful in its physical being. These digital systems are abstract. They're zeros and ones. They're a representation of something, but they're not the something. A bacteria is the something. When a bacteria is thinking, it's actual physical molecules moving around, changing in physical reality. They're embodying the experience. This is why it's, consciousness confuses people. Consciousness is rooted in this physical activity of molecules. It's rooted in quantum activity. Digital stuff it abstracts all that out. It's not connected to the real world in any meaningful way. Mm. Yeah, you can have inputs, but these inputs are immediately abstracted. The inputs to us, like into our eyes, it's changing molecules in our retina. We have a retina. The retina is physically moving around. We get tired. The retina changes. The bright light changes. Our retina gets over time. At every aspect of our mind, there's physical things that are connected with the world. Right now, our bodies are reacting to quantum events, trillions, quadrillions, quintillions of quantum events every microsecond. Our body is reacting to it. Part of that. Mm -hmm. The in-text calls it mind seed. 
that these quantum events that what they call chaotica, but this constant events are generating thoughts. You have to be part of the mind seed. Digital AI is not part of mind seed. It's an abstraction. It's like a book. We don't have to be afraid of books one day taking over the world. Uh, yeah. Unplug the AI and it's and it's done. You know, yeah, you can make an AI that hunts energy sources, but it hunts energy sources that are there. It's not. We actually take in the physical world. We eat. We can, I can grab things around me and shove them in my mouth, and they'll turn into more mind and more energy. That that's not how uh, uh, machines are, and, and, and digital machines are never going to, you know, be out there hunting new forms of, of food and creating new forms of food for themselves. <laughs> Do you, do you find that, Ogi, when, when you're approached, maybe I, I think I watched your conversation with Robert on Closer to Truth. Do you find when, when philosophers try and dissect your theory of consciousness that you get tired of these arguments, when you get tired of these arguments like idealism or panpsychism and these various other fields? How do you feel when people approach you with those different theories of consciousness from a philosophical perspective? Conscious. Consciousness is terrifically important. It's terrifically vital and it's hard. It's big. I never knock anybody for how they approach consciousness. It's difficult. Great minds uh, have died on, <laughs> on consciousness. Uh, centuries of people have tried to crack this. So the fact that you know people have theories that are wrong, they're just continuing a long tradition and they should. I mean, the only way to, to understand it is to wrestle with it and grapple with it. You're going to have bad ideas. Most of my ideas about consciousness for most of my life, as I was trying to figure out, were wrong. You know, I I, I started out, you know, when, when I was first contacted by Intex, I thought we had souls. You know, I remember mm. I thought we had souls attached to us at birth. And, and I was confused about whether animals had souls. And I was stumped about a Siamese twins. I was like, do they have two souls? Do they have one soul? What if their brain are connected? Is that too, like, I these were the kinds of challenges I started out with um, myself. So I, I don't knock anybody. It's hard. And the sad truth of it, I don't know if it's sad. The truth of it is you need to know some math, some complicated math. If you want to understand gravity and space time, you need to know some math to understand relativity. It's not impossible, but it does take some effort. Philosophers don't, do, don't use math. I, Dan did it. I, I imagine he's still considered the number one voice on uh, on uh, consciousness uh, even today. I, I I don't know. I can't evaluate that. But certainly in the 90s, he was the most prominent voice. If you talk to most academics about consciousness, they, they name him. He doesn't know any damn math. Uh, he was exposed to Steve Grossberg's math in the 90s, early 90s, before he ever wrote Consciousness Explained. Steve Grossberg explained to him that filling in is a real Thing, this idea that uh, even if you're not directly looking at it, that your mind is like if you're looking at a blank wall, let's say you're looking at a red wall, that you're not actually seeing all the wall, your mold's filling in the red. And, and, and Steve showed uh, Dan then at the math and he went and published a book and said there's no filling in anyway because of philosophy. So here's a guy that actually showed him physically and mathematically how filling in works. And he just went on and, and said his physical philosophical intuition told him that, that, that there can't be filling in. Uh, it's just silly. Like philosophers didn't figure out the theory of relativity. Philosophers didn't figure out gravity. Newton worked through that stuff. Uh, Einstein worked through that stuff mathematically and physically. That's the only way to do it. If you're not deep down in the physical nature of what's happening in the brain, if you're trying to do it abstractly, like, well, people think and have experiences, but it's made of matter. How can that be? It's a hard problem. Like if that's what you're doing, you're, you're not investing even the slightest effort in understanding the subject, the brain is ridiculously complicated. The math is ridiculously complicated. If you want to figure it out, you got to immerse yourself in it. Be humble. <laughs> Don't think that this simple, this super simple idea that you came up with without any effort, you know, is going to be the answer. <laughs> yeah, no, look, I firmly agree with that. I mean, you and Sai often talk about this hierarchy and this, this anthropocentric view that humans tend to have and the way we sort of put ourselves on these pedestals. Um, and, and give ourselves this Ian Vital now in a new sense with consciousness. And I, I completely agree. We tend to do that. And a lot of the time we need people like Copernicus to take us out of the center of the universe, or we need someone like Darwin to just show us that we're not at the top of this food chain that we yeah. think we're on. Um, but then what do you think about certain people who do take a very scientific perspective and look at the math, look at the neuroscience, look at the physics, someone like Donald Hoffman, for example, who looks at the evolutionary basis of consciousness, fitness payoffs, and the way we perceive reality, and then comes to this conclusion that we don't see reality for what it is at all, based on the mathematics, based on the physics. And then 
how do you view someone who says that and then takes it further by saying, in fact, consciousness is the fundamental reality and physics is produced from consciousness? You don't get, you don't buy it. I, 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 I have to, I, you know, I, I'd rather read it to, to do it justice. I, I hate, you know, not okay, doing something okay. where, where okay. maybe I, I have the wrong understanding of it, okay. but I can address the interaction of, of physics and mind, the interaction of the way of matter yeah. and the way of mind, and they feed into each other. One's not, you know, conscious is, uh, is definitely not the ultimate reality. Yeah. It's just consciousness is physical dynamics on the third rung of the ladder of purpose. Again, molecule minds, we can describe the dynamics, the physical activity inside individual cells, inside individual neurons very well. Uh, completely in some cases, like in certain archaea, we can describe everything that's happening perfectly well. So there's no mystery. Then you put it together with the neuron minds. We can describe there are organisms where we've worked out all the neurons in the circuit and, and, and how it all functions. Uh, and it keeps going. So consciousness is just the physical activity on the third level. Now we got a fourth level, self-consciousness. That's new activity. It uses the same matter. It's different dynamics. This is what's so hard. People inevitably end up treating consciousness as a thing. Like this view that I, I might might have a wrong understanding of, of Hoffman's theory based on what you said, but the idea that consciousness is the interface to mm. reality. Like, I mean, that's th there's a sense of which is true, but that's not that's not the right kind of intuition. That's not going to lead you to the right places. You need to think of consciousness as one level of activity. Keep in mind all these. Why are there are all these levels of minds. Why is there this ladder of purpose? What does each new level get you? It always takes an increased number of perspectives on reality and unites it to give a broader, richer, more collective reality. So at first in bacteria, archaea, molecule minds, they're just, their scope of reality is tiny. You know, you know microns, you know, <laughs> millimeters. I think, you know, bacteria travel like a, you know, a couple centimeters in a time or something like that. Um, and, and then a jelly, a bumblebee, they have broader scope uh, of reality because their neurons are all coming together. Each of their neurons has a different perspective. They're able to assemble a broader perspective and it just keeps going. So it's looking at individual consciousness. That's not where you want to focus. Think about you've got a whole society of conscious individuals. We each have our own perspective. We each have our own ideas. We're each pursuing our own goals. But it's this collective that unconsciously understands reality. That's what a supermind is doing. A supermind, you know, America making a decision. Should we raise taxes or lower taxes? Should we fight Russia? Should we just send arms to Ukraine? These are collective decisions. We have so many perspectives of individual citizens that all contribute to the final decision. Uh, that will happen. That's a better way of thinking about it. Don't think of consciousness as in itself some magical thing. Like as soon as you start getting lost in that, as opposed to thinking of it as dynamics, like ocean currents. Think about consciousness as just as currents or tidal waves as something in motion. That's the right way to think about it. Not as the interface to reality. That, that's going to set you on the wrong path. There's layers of consciousness and the conscious layers interact. Mm -hmm. You know, our our ability to be self-aware interacts with our ability to be aware, which interacts with uh, neural circuits, which interacts with our individual molecules, all of these. It's a hierarchy of resonances always. And that ladder of purpose is trying to build a new layer, a new layer of resonance by integrating. It's always trying to go out more broadly so it can understand reality better, make predictions about reality better. And it never stops. It's just layer after layer of consciousness. So then how do you feel about the fact that when we do perceive reality, we have so many limitations, heuristic adaptations to the environment, and we're not really in touch with reality. When 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 physics tries to explain matter, we, we know that it's 99.9% .9 empty space. We don't really know what it is. Although yeah. I, I'm very much a physicalist my person myself. I mean, my view is I don't really view consciousness as the be all end on of existence, but I do take a physicalist account of reality. But for those who do, for the panpsychist, for the idealist, for someone who claims that everything is other conscious or consciousness is all there is, uh, and justified by saying we don't understand what matter is, how do you approach someone like well, that? Well, I, I mean, one easy thing is uh, I can find matter that nobody's conscious of. You know, there, there, there's matter out there, purposeless activity happening that nobody's 
aware of. So if, if the whole universe is <laughs> consciousness, then there shouldn't be anything that's not uh, a part of consciousness. I mean, this is why we can't, you know, there's tangled particles. Tangled particles are particles we're aware of, you know, and there's untangled particles, which means we don't know anything about them, which means they're not part of our, our consciousness. And we want this dynamic, we want this, you know, tangled versus untangled, aware versus not aware. It, it, it drives, for all of this to work, a cosmic cycle to work, you need differences. You know, this idea that if everything's one thing, that's exactly what this fail-safe supreme is designed to block. If everything's one thing, it freezes up. You want there to be different things. You want there to be things competing, that it could be this or might be that. Like, that's what that's what causes the universe to unfold. There needs to be differences. You know, it's the differences that lead to change, lead to new ideas, lead to new experiences. So do you believe then that the a philosophical approach of trying to find that phenomenal, what is it like, essence of consciousness is just a dead end and it's something that yeah they- absolutely mm. it's complexity it's dynamic it's lots of elements it's hierarchical you know it's, it's lateral you know it's lots of things interacting it's collective systems that's it as soon as you're looking for the essence that's thing thinking that's looking for caloric that's looking for phlogiston that's looking for elan vital always a failure you know, centuries of failure with that sort of thinking. So you think we learned our lesson, but no, I, the reason it's so appealing is that now we understand how consciousness works. Mm-hmm. It's resonance. We resonate on things. Every conscious experience is a thing experience. We are aware of stuff. We resonate on an apple, resonate on the redness of the apple, the roundness of the apple, the sweetness of the apple, of something is what we're resonating on. Our conscious brain is designed to think about things. So we have naturally, here's something new, we thingify it. There must be a thing. It must be caloric heat. It must be some kind of liquid life. There must be some magical substance in their consciousness. We're going to dig down and find the essence of consciousness. Bad intuition. But uh, thanks to, this is why we have literature and books and science where we talk to each other is to learn this stuff, is to share experiences and start to realize where there are fallacies and mistakes and errors and confusions and that sort of thing. And now we can draw upon, you know what? Scientists have over and over and over and over and over again looked for the essence of stuff and it never works out. And so we have a reason, a priori reason to suspect that looking for the essence of consciousness is a, is a losing game. Mm. But we don't need to. We have a very good explanation. Steve Gross has worked out all the math for it. It works great. You can see how intuitive it is. It leads to new ideas very naturally. It explains autism, explains pain, explains uh, uh, language. You know, it leads to self-awareness. It leads to this latter purpose. You know, we can understand how the minds of bacteria under, more clearly by understanding how our consciousness works. And this is the great thing about it. It integrates. It integrates. You know, you've got some good science when it connects with things you never thought were connected before. And that's what this view of consciousness does. If you're looking for the essence of consciousness, you're pushing all the other stuff away. You're saying, okay, I don't care about language. That's something else. I don't care about bacteria, what they're doing. What does that matter? But it's only when you care about all these things together, holistically, you start to see how consciousness fits within them all. It's like a unit. And again, again, that's what happened with Elan Vital. Mm. We cracked it. Not by digging deeper and deeper, but by looking at it holistically, caloric, same thing. We understood heat by looking at it as a system collectively, not trying to drill down into the one reductionist thing. Mm. It's funny. Physicists are fond, of, so fond of saying like reduction is a way and, you know, that all theories that have worked are reductionist, except heat, life, combustion. Those are all holistic theories. They're not reductionist theories. They're dynamic theories. So I, physicists even delude themselves sometimes about their own theories about what they are. They're not reductionistic. You know, the theory of heat, it's not a reductionist theory. I think another thing is, is, is when you're actually reducing certain things to their component parts, sometimes you're not really reducing it and bringing it down in a sense. You're sort of highlighting each component part more. Um, yeah. For example, bringing in the fact that we're subatomic particles becoming sort of biology or chemistry biology, moving into physiology, it's it's just broadening the story and creating so much more yes. of holistic theory of consciousness in general. So so in a sense, someone might claim that your theory is very reductionist, but but in a sense, it's not really reducing it. It's more just no, it's highlighting. More <laughs> yeah, it's sort of highlighting. Well, it's holistic and it's it is, it is dynamic. I mean, it's so mm-hmm. like take consciousness itself. It's it's not being reduced to mm-hmm. like here's the consciousness elements. It's a complicated dynamic across many elements hierarchical you can't understand consciousness without understanding 
three layers of hierarchical quantum related dynamics, you know, dynamics of a molecule mind, embedded within the dynamics of a neural circuit, embedded within the dynamics of a module, which is producing consciousness through its communication with other modules. It is all this. It's a system like life, just like life. There's no Elan Vital. There's not, it's not protoplasm. It's not DNA. There's not some thing that you point to and say, that is the secret of life. Life is the collective, this holistic activity, this holistic system of many purposeful things. Is there is there any other aspect of, of Stephen's work that really impacted you to a point where you feel like, I mean, this is why you perceive this guy as, as, as the greatest man of our time? It is that he has worked out the math for so many different parts of the mind at so many different levels. Uh, he worked out how language works in the brain, how we process phonemes, how we process uh, visual inputs, audio inputs, uh, how uh, the response signal in individual neurons, he showed why it has to have a sigmoid shape, which is what it has, as opposed to a linear shape or, or, or other shapes. You know, So he works out the math down at the lowest level, like a neural, uh, the, the neural response uh, function, you know, all the way up to language, which is intermind uh, dynamics. He has math at all these levels that all fit together. It, it's a lot like uh, the way, uh, you know, quantum physics, you can fit together the, the, mag the math of electromagnetism with the math of, of, of uh, you know, the weak theory and strong theory and all of this forms, you know, theory of, of particles and forces, uh, you know. So, so he did the same thing. He united most parts of the mind within a integrated uh, mathematical framework. Uh, it's a beautiful thing, but really complicated math that you can't, you can't borrow something else. You can't learn relativity and say, oh, it's just a version of relativity or, or Bayesian math. You can't learn it and say, oh, I see. It's just a subset of Bayesian math. No, 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 no. It's its own math. It's the math of minds. It's the math of purpose. Let me say one other thing. I, I, this is all so much I know. No, so, I don't. Uh, about the dynamics of purpose, evolution, evolutionary theory. I told you when I was first in tech shared this with me, I knew I needed a mathematical framework for the mind. So I started having the ideas about the mind, the dynamics, but I needed math. I didn't know how to put any of this into math and that I could share with other humans. And Intex was sharing with me the dynamics, but not like equations. They, they weren't communicating equations. So I didn't really know how to, to, to talk about this uh, stuff. So at first I looked into evolutionary theory. I thought because evolution involved purpose. And there was a little bit of math in, in evolutionary theory. I, I, and it just seemed math. It, it was talking about competition. It was talking about purpose and design and, and, and trajectories over time, things that I was interested in. So I, I thought, okay, this there's probably going to be some math here. So that was the first mathematical framework I was looking at. And I very quickly, it wasn't just that I realized evolutionary psychology uh, was misguided and, and a dead end, which, which I even more think now. I mean, it is a dead end. It didn't get anywhere. Um, <laughs> But what I came to realize is I thought scientists and biologists had a wrong understanding about evolution. I think natural selection, evo Darwinian evolution by natural selection, it exists, it's real. It's just a subset of the dynamics of purpose and the dynamics of evolution and not even the main one. Most evolution in the universe is not evolution by natural selection. From here on out, all human evolution and we are evolving, we're creating new things, the internet is evolution, is not genetic. It's not by natural selection. It's by other dynamics of evolution, dynamics of purpose. So the way of mind is a broad collection of classes of purpose, mental dynamics, consciousness are dynamics of purpose. So is evolution by natural selection, but it's very narrow and limited. And it doesn't even describe accurately genetic evolution. It places too much emphasis on the things, on the genes. Uh, Richard Dawkins wrote this book called The Selfish Gene, which kind of summarized uh, this view, this thing view uh, of evolution as things saying like the, 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 the main element for evolution is the gene, the selfish gene. By understanding the gene, you understand evolution. No, no, no. Evolution is dynamics. It's lots of things interacting, not just the genes, all kinds of levels of purpose. Once you've got a mind, that mind is controlling the organism's activity. That mind is doing more to shape evolution than any gene is. Our decisions on what to do with our lives, our human decisions, are gonna play a much bigger role than any particular 
a gene in their life to suggest that if you look at, you find this gene in, in your DNA or this person's DNA and think that that's going to help you understand how their life will unfold uh, as opposed to understanding their psychology and how their mind is going to uh, unfold in situation. Yeah, it's, it's just silly. So um, I started to realize as I was studying the evolution by uh, evolutionary psychology that I thought all of evolution theory just <laughs> was wrong, was too narrow, too limited. It was ignoring the dynamics. Mm. I thought mind, it was really the story of mind trying to unfold. The body is just this extraneous part of the mind. The way to think about the body is, is, is just an extension of the mind, not the way biologists imagine is the body is evolving and the mind is part of this, this physical, physiological evolution. No, mm. it's the mind evolving. We see that because now the mind is continuing to evolve. It didn't stop. Mm. It got to genes and it just jumped out of genes, jumped right into... Uh, into words, into language, into books. Books is shaping the evolution of our minds. And now it's the internet. You know, from one genes way you can see that. From genes. One, one way you can see that. Yes, exactly. Genes to memes. And you can see this in human sexuality. Sexuality. Sai and I wrote a book about sexuality. We wrote about the first generation. Yes, it was called of, A Billion Wicked Things, I think. Was a Billion Wicked Thoughts. Yes. Oh. First book by, by Sai Ganam and I, A Billion Wicked Thoughts. Mm -hmm. And we looked at sexual behavior on the internet. So we got massive, we, we got massive online data sets of online sexual behavior searches, um, traffic to different websites. We got credit card billing statements. We looked at erotic stories, like millions of erotic stories. We, 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 we classified them. If there was data on people's sexual behavior, on the internet, we got it. Now we didn't know this at the time, but now we understand that all that data was about the first generation of people coming on, internet and expressing their sexuality. We got to see raw human sexuality as it existed on the planet when the internet first appeared. So we got to see sexuality in China, in Russia, in Saudi Arabia, Brazil, all across America, at least a billion people's sexual behavior. We accumulated, we looked at it, and it was a snapshot of human sexual behavior in the raw as we integrated with the internet. The problem is the internet took over and the sex we see on the internet now is completely different. It's been commercialized. It's narrow. The por At first, everybody was making porn. There was all kinds of amateur porn producers. There was tens of thousands of commercial porn sites. There was all kinds of people writing erotic stories. It was the Wild West and incredibly diverse. And human sexuality was this beautiful, diverse thing. Not anymore. It's very narrow. All the porn you see now, uh, tube sites took over. Mm. And then the tube sites got bought out by multinational uh, conglomerates. So all the human sexuality on the internet now is controlled by a few small corporations and they've narrowed the porn. They don't want it to be controversial. They've also learned what gets the most audiences for the cheapest, just like any business. So now we see sex that's easy to produce. We don't see that rich variety anymore. So now all humans that are learning about sexuality, on, we're all learning about it through the internet. That's what we interact with. We're entering an ecology, an ecosystem of memes that narrows our sexuality and limits it. It's kind of graying or homogenizing or making everything vanilla. We're all moving towards the same sexuality across the entire entire planet. You know, our kids and our grandkids are going to have sexual interests and sexual behaviors that are strange to us that we won't understand, uh, just like our sexuality is strange to people that lived a, a hundred years ago. So the the the, the super mind, you know, this collective dynamics that we're creating, this these new technologies are changing our sexuality, which was viewed as very much the domain of Darwinian natural selection and genetics. But, you know, now we're pushing into whole new kinds of uh, changes to our sexuality that are not genes based. If, if, if you had to apply that analogous to us as human minds in general and to the way the internet works, do you think that's going to be a downfall to us reaching a sort of hypermind status or maybe that ultra mind that you spoke about earlier? Do you think that the way? No, I, don't think so. no I, I think this is an essential step. We all got to get linked together. So this is how to look when it's finally working, is that we'll all be linked together, but we'll be diverse. Our individuality will be respected and accepted. I might say and have different opinions and values and beliefs than you, utterly different, you know, opposite sides of the political aisle. And we must accept this as this is the basis for intelligence and freedom and adaptiveness and resilience. This is what we see in the brain, our neurons are incredibly diverse. There's no two neurons that are identical. This is a basic design uh, feature. Mm. Uh, the more advanced the high-level mind, the more advanced the lower levels. The human brain 
is the most advanced brain on the planet on every level. We have the most sophisticated neurons on Earth, the pyramidal neuron in our frontal cortex, which is in our Y module. The Y module determines our feelings. It determines why we should choose this choice over that choice because this feels better than that choice. This is the most sophisticated mind on Earth, only found in human minds. Other animals have Y modules, but they're much uh, uh, less powerful and less complicated than ours. So the higher you go, you get higher by having all of your levels be more uh, sophisticated as well. So in America, I mean, America is the most sophisticated supermind on Earth at this moment. You know, who knows if it, it will, will, will retain that. Um, and it's because we, we're so free, because we talk endlessly, because we have this internet and that we're all sharing uh, everything on the internet and we're sharing our sexuality. The fact that our sexuality is all converging might facilitate Hyper minds more probably, you know, like that might be one hang up is that it might be very hard. You can see all the politics and drama that emerges from just homosexuals and heterosexuals in the same society. We're working through it. They're way further along than we were 50 years ago. Obviously, we got a ways to go. But yeah. one day, you know, hopefully we'll have a system where all of our individuality is respected, but we're all bound together. That's how the brain works. That's how even brains of insects work and yeah. even down at the bacteria. It's diverse elements that are each given a voice. They each have uh, the same authority and power. No neuron is more important than any other neuron, but we respect every neuron's individuality. Every neuron has a chance of making a contribution. And yeah. the weird neurons are as useful uh, as the vanilla neurons is, is how it works out. And, and that's what we're moving to. So having us all bound together to the internet, this is a necessary precursor. I mean, there's all this fight and drama and friction because we're seeing other people who are different from us. And it, it's a new experience. You know, it's like we see voices that are radically different from our beliefs. And, and we just don't have the experience yet and the, the lessons and school and, and the social norms yet to adapt. We're fighting. But, uh, I, you know, we'll work through this. Mm. Or we won't, and, and, and we'll have climate collapse. <laughs> I mean, on, on that, you, I mean, this diversity, this sheer diversity, when you think about the intakes and these extraterrestrials, you label these as extraterrestrials. Did, do, do you feel that these came from a completely different set of organisms in another, in another sphere, galaxy, perhaps part of the universe? Well, Was it my understanding, and, and, and this is not something I'm certain of, so I'm presenting this as, as, as this is what it seems like, um, is that these the axiomized minds, five and three, the ones that get to the, the top level and can start to compete for influence over, over the physical laws undergirding reality, that they're comprised of many, many, many species that evolved and came up uh, across the universe, possibly multiple universes too. I, I don't pretend to understand that, but the, the, what's always been conveyed to me is it's lots of different heritages, lots of different lines of purpose uh, that came together, which is what we are too. I mean, you know, there's the East and the West, you know, Columbus and, and the Europeans sailed and, and discovered, obviously they didn't discover and, and found uh, what they call the new world. But those were two lines of evolutionary history of people that were independent and then came together. So they didn't even happen here on earth. I mean, there was many kinds of humans. Uh, we keep finding new kinds. It was Neanderthal, Erectus, there was the Florenzis, the Hobbits, on an island somewhere on, on Indonesia. I, I know there's even other, Devos, Devosan, I, I think. No, I, I don't, I don't keep, Africa, there's also home in the lady. So there you go. In Africa, they, they keep discovering, so you would know more about this than me, but they keep discovering new humans. And they, a lot of these humans were contemporaneous. So uh, they came together, they're in us. I mean, if you look at our DNA, some of these other species merged into us. So I, I think it's a lot, my understanding is it's like that, that there's one day we may join too. We will ascend, but you know, Maybe we'll probably colonize our solar system. You know, we'll, we'll reach, I don't know, an ultramind level. You know, superminds combine to hyperminds, hyperminds combine to ultramind. Probably we'll have an ultramind human solar system. And that maybe will be, we'll meet up with other ultraminds and form alliances and over time merge, is my understanding. And then we just keep building. And some of these, apparently, this, this they have conveyed in, in clear terms is like you never know where your ascension is going to end. You might get to this ultramind level and then that's, you compete against another ultramind and lose and you're wiped out and all its constituent species then get, get wiped out too. But it's a never ending growth. You're trying to ascend the ladder. Some get to the axiomized and even the axiomized are not eternal. Mm. You know, all minds, all dynamics are dynamic. They have a start and the end. And again, because you can't ever have one 
eternal, all-knowing, omniscient mind. It's all designed so that new life can form, mm -hmm. new minds can form. Humans are going to have different ideas than any other creatures in the universe, and hopefully we'll get our chance to shine our light on the universe and shine our ideas and, and, and propose new ideas. Our artists and scientists and creators, there is human science, and it's different than these other sciences. So here's a way of thinking about the difference between art and science and higher levels. So art is dynamics within an individual mind. Art is mind to mind sharing. I am sharing my individual experience. I'm writing a book. I'm making a painting. This is what life is like to me. Here's some experience of mine that I want to share with you. And you as another person, take that experience directly. And maybe it will mean something to you. Maybe it won't, but it's a direct mind to mind experience. That's art. Science is our super mind experience. Science is articulating what our experience of reality is like as a supermind, right? this collective experience. We experience electromagnetic radiation that follows these laws. We experience e equals mc squared. Now we've got the three equations of consciousness. This is, this is what our human society has experienced, and we're organizing it as best we can. Apparently, when we encounter other uh, societies, civilizations that have risen to another level, their view of this will be slightly different. I mean, there'll be some overlap. We all remember the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. All of us have the Big Bang is in the past for all creatures, for all minds, for all the axiom minds. We all remember the Big Bang. So we will have some commonalities, but our overall experiences, we might have different perspectives on the electromagnetic force than others. And then we'll share these. And together, these will give us a whole new perspective above science. I call it blood magic entirely for personal reasons, this level of understanding that's above science. So there's art, there's science, there's blood magic. Um, but uh, yes, so human science is certainly figuring out reality as humans are experiencing it, but other creatures might experience the same reality differently. And one day we'll combine our views with theirs and we'll grow, we'll all grow as, as a result of it. Is, is That's what this view is and that's what Intex's uh, have been telling me. <laughs> do, you, do you think that they've, that radio, you said it often happens with radio waves and yeah, radio is sort of, maybe antennas and stuff. Do you think that there's a reason this happens via that electromagnetic spectrum? Do you think that's a, there's a specific special quality to that that allows the communication to occur? Do you think? I mean, it is very, it is very, very interesting that it's electromagnetic radiation that's the limiting, mm. you know, speed of the cosmos, you know, that, that it's nothing goes faster than electromagnetic radiation with light. But uh, it is very, a very curious thing that that is the, the, the force, that is the dynamic uh, and I, I can't say I understand why. That is a mystery I'm, I'm interested in. I, 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 I try to find out from Intex, but they haven't given me, they, they addressed it in a, in a way that I couldn't uh, make sense of it. But but I, I, I find that the most curious thing. Like, there, you know, there's these four forces. I, gravity is really something different. I, I don't think, you know, physicists want this integrated theory, unified theory, gravity to integrate with uh, the quantum physics. I don't even know if that's necessary or the right way of looking at it. I'm a little agnostic, uh, but a little skeptical maybe uh, of that. But I mean, uh, is it really, th this more than anything lets me believe that electromagnetic and strong and weak really are the same force, because that would make the most sense that this force, you can't go faster than the one force, uh, the way of matter, you know, that that, that yeah. seems to make more sense to me. Uh, but that is, that is something that, that I find baffling is why that, it is electromagnetic radiation, that's the thing that nothing can go. It is quite intriguing. It kind of fixes space time, yeah. Yeah. Look, so, well, okay, this has been amazing. I mean, so, so many things to absorb. A lot of the, I think the listeners and the viewers are going to be completely shocked, of course, to hear, to, to hear this. <laughs> but I mean, from how thinking emerged from chaos to obviously a cosmic cycle, what would you think are the most important takeaways from, from the journey of the mind uh, going into this new cosmic cycle that obviously people are going to hear about? And what should they take away from the previous book going into this new book and what can they expect? The number one takeaway, you know, as I said, but I really, this can't be emphasized enough, is that the universe was designed for love, for compassion, for empathy, for connection. This is part of the design. This exists because of the fail-safe supreme, because the universe is designed so that there can never be a single God, there can never be one all-knowing, all-powerful being. That allows love to emerge and emerge and emerge to, again. And it's up to us to find that love. None of this is predestined. None of this is foretold. We have free will and we can choose actions and behaviors that lead to love, lead to greater love. We can choose 
to love others and to behave kindly. It's within our purview. And it matters. Whether we do or not alters the future, determines whether humankind will ascend or not. It's wonderful. We're given all the tools we need, all the opportunities we need to ascend, but it's up to us, up to us as individuals, up to us as individual communities, and up to us collectively as a species. We designed the universe, thinking beings like us, and we continue to design the universe. It's on our shoulders. The universe is made for us. We're supposed to be here. We enjoy it, love one another, create, try to solve it. All of this contributes to this cycle, contributes to this never-ending story. It's a lovely thing. You can study the math and physics and science at any level. It's wonderful to do so, to experience all that. It can all be known. It's a great thing. It allows all of us our own individual journeys of understanding and self-awareness and growth. It allows societies, it allows species, all of us to have a chance and aspiring to those higher rungs. It's wonderful. Mm. I think, I mean, you say, you say it perfectly. It's, it's beautiful. We, but when you th we, to close off, I think we'll close off soon, but how's your time? You're all right for time? Are you? Sure, yes. Just to, when you think about this teleology, I mean, you're saying that the universe is designed for this, for the love um, and, and this purpose. Does the, do you think that is compatible then with, a, with, free, with free will? Do you think that we're meant to get to that point or do you think that we don't have to necessarily, and, and there is an alternative. Free will has, has to be created and it has to be embraced. Free will is one of the categories of dynamics that exists only if you believe it exists. There's a lot of dynamics. There's a lot of things in the reality that only exist if you think they exist. Beauty is another one. Like be there's no beauty in the universe unless you think there's beauty in the universe. So you have to believe in free will. If you don't believe in free will, you'll never have free will. So it, it is a sophisticated act. It takes a sophisticated mental architecture, mental structure, flies, mm -hmm. insects do not have free will. Um, and uh, animals, but besides humans, don't have free will. You need this fourth rung. You need language to have free will. Uh, but it's designed, if you have to rise to free will. And for a country to have free will, requires building. For all these higher minds too, you need to build the architecture. It doesn't happen automatically. It's not magical. It's, it's not like a spiritual event. It's just building the architecture like anything else, the architecture of, of purpose. You know, in our own brains, you know, we can explain it, it involves the basal ganglia. That's an essential uh, structure in our own free will, but you need a society around you as well. You can't have free will without having a without being embedded within a super mind because the super mind needs to give you language and sophisticated concepts the notion of free will you need a notion of free will to have free will a chimpanzee can't ascend to it because it can't understand its mind can't ever form this idea that i am deciding my own fate like that's that's a complicated idea hmm. a sophisticated idea kids can't understand it takes time for society, for species, for supermind to even build up that idea and then for the individuals to embrace it as it should be though. You know, free will is earned. You have to work for it as it should be, you know, and then you develop it. You can have more or less free will, you know, based on the architecture you have, you know, based on the experiences, based on the decisions you made can lead to more or less free will. That's part of this journey too. It's a journey of love and a journey of free will. Just the freedom of action is a way to think of free will. And that's what, that's why diversity is, so essential. The more views and perspectives, the more people we have with different ideas, the greater the range of freedom of action that we have. I mean, the ideas I have of things I can do are limited by my brain, but maybe you'll share an idea I've never had of something I can do. That might expand my range of free will. I'm now sharing with you and your listeners, you know, a view of free will that you can embrace it. You can choose it. Like choosing the free will is what creates free will, and then you develop it. Like now you have this idea and maybe some people will develop their own free will, you know, within this framework. So to, when you, when you mentioned this, it, it's designed for this love. If, if someone had to ask you then who designed it, what, what, what would you say? We did, we did. I, all, all minds, we all rise. So there's a saying in text have, uh, we all work for zero and to zero, we all return. So there's this chaotic quantum physics, way of matter happening everywhere all the time, just this endless frothing. And from this frothing, there's always the potential 
for structures to grow. And from those structures, there's always the chance for minds to grow. If you just take uh, molecules and organize them in the right way, you can create purpose out of that. And that this is just happening constantly of its own accord. Molecule minds arising all the time in different places in the universe out of this chaotic, out of this quantum froth. And maybe they'll rise to neuron minds or maybe not, you know, like uh, maybe on, we'll find on Titan, you know, or, or some moon of Saturn, uh, maybe there'll be molecule minds, but nothing more. Maybe they couldn't ascend to the next level. And this is, it's always trying to ascend. Maybe they'll get to the next level. Here on Earth, we've got to super mind level. We have self-awareness on Earth, but that's how far we've gotten. Maybe we'll keep going. Maybe not. But mm -hmm. this just keeps arising as long as you have it. And then the axiomized minds, if you get to the top, they're constantly creating new physical dynamics, like a new kind of predictive randomness, new kind of quantum physics. So it's just constantly churning. So it was minds that came before us and generations before that shaped the reality we have now, but we are shaping the reality that future minds will have. And it just goes on and on and on. Do you, so do you, overall, you think that they, they, there's a possibility that there's a multiverse of sort of mind shaping universes out there? I do not think there's a multiverse. Okay. I do not think, I don't not think there's a multiverse in the sense that there's infinite, infinite versions of us in other realities. I, I, some physics s have this idea that anytime there's a quantum event, you know, the atom goes this way and this way, they, there's two universes, you know, they, that both these universes are brought into existence. I don't think that's necessary. I, I think it's a little silly. It doesn't match up with anything in Texas share with me. It's that the universe just keeps going on and on forever. There's always new minds, always new experiences. They're ascending. Some are falling, some reach the top, and they change, change the whole context for the next round of this going on. And it just that just goes on and on forever. Not we're not creating parallel universes. There's there's, there's not like a creation of like you can't jump and meet you know some other version of you in, in some other uh, reality. It's how I understand it, but you know I I, I can't say for sure. I'm, I'm I'm no expert. It's just that that it's very much doesn't match this cosmic cycle. Uh, framework that, that Intex has been sharing with me for 30 years. There might be some way to work it in there, but it, it, it feels unnatural and unnecessary. So they're definitely, so they're definitely from this universe in, in that sense, from you, from your perspective, they are fundamentally part of this fabric of reality. Yeah. Yeah. We're all, we're all in this universe together. We all share the same, as far as I understand, there's one physical universe and, and we're all in it and we all remember the big bang. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, have they ever told you anything that you consider to be fundamentally wrong? No, no, no. I, I mean, no, I, there's been plenty of things I didn't understand, mm. you know, but, 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 but where, where I, I had a wrong understanding. So sometimes there's been that, but, you know, eventually when I understand it clearly, then, then I realized it wasn't, it wasn't wrong. The limitations have always been on me, you know, like, like it's, it's really confusing and hard to understand almost always at first. And then it just takes time to kind of, kind of figure out. So if there's any mistakes, it's, it's from, I think it's from me. You know, but 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 it all it all jives, you know, really well. I mean, you read Journey of the Mind. It, it just it matches, it matches in a way these other theories of consciousness don't. In, in a broader scale, you know, levels and broader reach, it just it folds so many more things into it. So that's why that's why I've that's why I've kept going with it. It just, it just keeps connecting more and more. You touched on a lot of what's going to happen in the future. Was there anything that they have told you about the past prior to our existence, prior to minds? that maybe we should know about that you think is worth sharing in general? There's something about the Big Bang. Mm. Um, the Big Bang's important. They're always talking about how we all remember it. Um, and I, they only tend to mention things that are important and relevant for understanding kind of the, the big picture. And so, yeah, there's something about the Big Bang. I don't think, you know, there's this mystery. It's a low entropy event. How did we get such a low entropy event. Mm. Uh, I I think that's part of the question, but I, I I think that's not the really the most important aspect of the question of the Big Bang. But yeah, so so there, there's something about the Big Bang and this relationship between the way of mind and the way of matter. I think you need a Big Bang for all of this, for free will and the unfolding of mind. Um, that there, there's some there's some crucial role, and that it's set in a certain way, and it has something to do with these games the axiomized minds are playing but but yeah i i that's beyond my understanding now so all i can say is it's that there's something there in the big bang that's crucially important to mind that, that's what i want to say it's crucially important to, to the unfolding of mind and purpose uh that, that that i don't 
quite have a handle on yet. Okay. And Ogi, your, your, the, your next book, the one you're working on now, anything you want to tell us about it? Anything? Um, in it's, called, it's called Large Gods for Small Children. And the opening of the book is, is available for free on my website, ogiogis.com right now. Um, for anybody that wants to read the opening and, and, and hopefully the whole book will be out in less than a year. Okay, so it's I, quite I think it should be out, I think it should be out in the, in the, the spring, but we will, we'll see. It's not set in stone yet. So. Fantastic. I'll put definitely, a, definitely under your year. So then I'll I, put I a link come back on your show after you read it. So no, 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 I think that's, down. that's definitely on the cards. I think I'm going to put a link into the descri description for the listeners and the viewers. And, and I'm looking forward to reading it. I, I'm, I'm very intrigued. If, if it's, if it's the reason why you've come up with your theory of consciousness and the work you've done, with, uh, with, with, Rose, with, with the theories that Stevens put through and the work you and Sai have come up with, I think it's definitely worth the read. Yeah. Journey of the Mind, the book I wrote with Sai, is the best way to describe it is fusing the mathematics of Steve Grossberg, yeah. the integrated mathematics of the mind Steve Grossberg came up with, with these revelations about the physical nature of reality <laughs> from the <laughs> from Intex. So those, that, that is what Journey of the Mind is. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, I mean, I can't wait. I hope the listeners enjoy it. I mean, this has been absolutely fa fascinating. Um, any any final words, Ogi, anything you want to say or leave out there? The universe is a, a beautiful place uh, and we're supposed to be here. It was designed for us. So so enjoy it and love one another. Uh, you know, we're, we're not random specks that happen to emerge from a purposeful universe. No, 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 no. We're part of a great story, a never ending story. And we all get to write some verses of the story. You know, it's a wonderful thing. There's no God, there's no single God, there's no single controller of it all. We all have a chance to influence the dynamics of reality and these 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 super beings that will, will come into uh, existence one day, of which we will be part of. You know, we will be part of these beings. We're part of these beings now without being fully aware of it or understanding it. And, and that's it's it's a wonderful view of, of the universe that that gives meaning to our lives without rejecting any of the physical reality. Uh, that we can we can see and test and experiment on. Yeah. Well, okay, that's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. You've been wonderful, Tevin. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I had a great time. Your questions are great, and I wish you the very best with your show. No, no, I can't wait to have you back for round two. I mean, it's it's been incredible. Thanks, Ogi. Thanks so much. Great talking to you. Mm -hmm.